Good evening and welcome to City Council meeting for October 13th, 2020. Uh, this meeting is being conducted with limited in-person attendance uh, under the governor's directives beginning with 006 and as modified since then. Items on our agenda may be taken out of order, two or more items may be combined, and items on the agenda may be removed or related discussion delayed at any time. Uh, with that, I will call the meeting to order and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll begin with our first public comment period. Public comment during this uh, portion of the meeting is limited to five minutes and must be pertaining to one of the one or more of the agenda items. Uh, because of the limited in-person attendance at the meeting, we've also provided for comments to be emailed in ahead of time, or we will be taking uh, calls from the public as well. At uh, this time, is there anyone here who would like to speak in public comment? Mr. Woodbury? Thank you. I have uh, written comments. Can I approach the city clerk? Uh, please have uh, the marshal bring them up. Yeah. I think there's enough there for everybody, but... Uh, in case I don't get through all of them, I'll be skipping around and summarizing a bit. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm Rod Woodbury, and I'm speaking tonight on agenda items 13 through 16. Uh, the desire demonstrated by some of you to get rid of Mr. Morris and Mr. Noyola dates back years to the time of their hiring and even earlier. Thankfully, some of you appear to have changed your mind on that. Last October, there was a council item to consider hiring special counsel to review their contracts. Several, including me, showed up to ask why. It seemed like you were hiding the ball from us. Of course, some suspected it was a prelude to firing them, but that wasn't clear. Well, now it is clear. If those of you pushing these items had been transparent, we wouldn't be here today with the city mired in litigation and now past the contractual deadline to terminate these in individuals. In the intervening months, we've had numerous allegations hurled back and forth and investigated, including complaints against Morris, the city council, and the, and the mayor. And even political favors traded to set aside impartiality and skew the results of those investigations. You should have avoided this by being transparent and holding the meeting to terminate these gentlemen in 2019 or early 2020, long before that right expired. In early August, I learned that a special council meeting was scheduled on August 6th to consider firing Morris and Noyola. So I emailed each of you, my representatives, requesting a short meeting or conference call to better understand the allegations and hear your perspectives. Councilwoman Bridges was the only one who called to share her views, including her frustrations with the accusations, the tactics employed, and the process. Mayor McManus acknowledged my email but refused to talk. Folda, Adams, and Hoskins ignored me and never responded. That's not transparency, it's just the opposite. It flies in the face of everything you've pretended to stand for in the past. Then I learned that the meeting was canceled due to a restraining order that found notice was deficient and violated the open meeting law. Again, that's the opposite of transparency. The OML is designed to aid us by ensuring that your actions are open, honest, and can be examined in broad daylight, day, daylight not hidden and carried out in secret. Since then, there have been several more attempts to avoid transparency. Mayor McManus attempted to violate the restraining or order by proceeding with the August 6th meeting. He and council members Hoskins, Adams, and Folder then communicated privately with each other to engage Bailey Kennedy's legal services before ever bringing that contract to the public's attention. Ms. Bridges was intentionally excluded from those discussions simply because she doesn't agree with you on every point, including tactics. 
The mayor admitted these communications at the August 11th meeting, but nobody disclosed having already spent almost $15,000 in taxpayer funds on Bailey Kennedy and so on. I don't know if these acts rise to the level of open meeting law or ethics violations, but they certainly show a complete disregard for transparency, which is something we definitely expect. We expect you to practice what you've preached to us over the years. You who engaged Bailey Kennedy have already spent almost $106,000 in taxpayer money in less than two months through the end of September. And since then, there have been more motions in court, so our taxpayer bill is likely now at least $150,000 and counting. And that's our money as citizens. There are also serious questions about proper notice for tonight's items 13 through 16. NRS 241 contains requirements that must be strictly followed. I don't know all the details, but it appears notice was sent late or argu arguably on the last possible day. The statute requires 21 working days. It also requires notice to the last known address of the individual you are, you are evaluating. I understand there's a dispute about that as well. Proof of service is also required. I don't see that in the backup materials. Why cut corners? Why risk further litigation and complaints against you? Why make a public spectacle where there doesn't need to be one? It will inevitably result in more of our taxpayer dollars being spent on litigation. There's no rush. You're already within six months of a council election. So why not back up, err on the side of caution, and do it right so there's no question? It will save us boatloads of money and won't prejudice the process at all. Section 11 of their contract states that each of them acknowledges that he is an at-will employee and is subject to termination by the council at any time, with or without cause, except within six months before or six months after a city council election. The next city council election, the April 6, 2021 primary election, is now less than six months away, so you've lost the opportunity to terminate for now. I caution you against doing so and thereby creating even more of a spectacle and more very expensive litigation. Even if that six month deadline hadn't already passed, you haven't noticed up anything close to just cause for termination. Cert certainly nothing like criminal convictions or a material contract violation that would al allow you to escape paying severance. In any case, you're now in no man's land and no longer within your legal rights to terminate. And I realize my time's out. I've got about a half page left. With your permission, I'll continue or I'll submit it on the record. Certainly, please finish. Thank you. If you don't like the quality of their performance, then just be transparent. Give your reasons and require them to do better going forward. In fact, why haven't you evaluated their performance and established goals for them on an annual basis as Section 8 of their contracts requires? That's, something, that's somewhat subjective, but at least it gives them a roadmap for doing their jobs the way you want them to. If the goal is a public spectacle and character assassination, then probably nothing I've said will stop you from going forward. So just in case, I attest without reservation that both Morris and Noyola, while imperfect like all of us, are men of exemplary character and confidence. You can't live in today's world without some detractors, but I'm confident that most of their peers, colleagues, and associates would back me up on that. So ask, ask around if there's any doubt. I echo Duncan McCoy's comments in his recent article, we can't afford to have inter, inter, interims and beginners in charge as we navigate the unfolding COVID-19 economic storm. We also need checks and balances. You might not like everything our management team does or says, but they're here to protect not only us as citizens, but also you public servants. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. You bet. Anyone else present that would like to speak during public comment? Madam City Clerk, do we have any emailed comments? Yes, we have several. The first one is from Alana Wise. I am Alana Wise, a resident of Boulder City since 2017. I support the text amendment 11-23, which will allow vehicles to be parked in back or side yards on rock, as well as be driven over rock to get into the back or side yard of the home. Please let me know if you have any questions about my position. Thank you for the opportunity to make my position on the amendment known. Next is from Matthew Ripplinger. He says he's a Boulder City resident. I support this text amendment change 11-23. Mike Mahaney, I am currently a resident of Boulder City and have been for 20 years. I support text amendment change 11-23. 
I found out about this amendment change in the Boulder City Review in an article written by Randy Lemos. Next, also regarding the text amendment, is from Kendra Howard. I am a Boulder City resident at 1573 Bermuda Dunes Drive. I support the text amendment change 11-23 being introduced at Tuesday's City Council meeting and up for vote in October. Thank you. Next is from Jason Howard saying he is a Boulder City resident at 1573 Bermuda Dunes. I support the text amendment change 11-23 being introduced at Tuesday City Council meeting. Charles Bicknell, I am a Boulder City resident and I support amendment 11-23. Thank you. Elizabeth Powell, regarding items 13 through 16, I wish to state my support for all four of these resolutions. I hope that you, our esteemed city council, will complete one of the most serious jobs that we have given you to do when we voted for you last year. We need for you to remove city staff that you have determined are holding up all of you on the city council from getting accurate information. You need to do your jobs. Thank you for all you do for all of us. Next is Nathaniel Gee, also regarding items 13 and 15. Thanks for the opportunity to comment. My name is Nathaniel Gee. I've lived in Boulder City the past 12 years. I love this town and seek to be supportive of staff and our elected officials. I know you don't have an easy job and I know the decisions before you tonight are not easy, but I wanted to let you know that I've had many interactions with city employees, both on a personal level and from a professional level. I can say without hesitation that the city has never been so effectively managed in my time here as it is today. Response times are quick. Customer service is excellent. Part of the reason is clearly that the two men you are discussing today have been effective at their job and they have the trust and respect of the city staff. I also know Steve Morris personally. He's a wise, hardworking, and most importantly, honest man. He loves Boulder City deeply and has chosen to raise his own family here after being raised here. I'm confident you will not find a better lawyer or better manager, but you will waste a lot of your time and our tax dollars trying. I mentioned the effectiveness of the city staff earlier, and I will admit there is one area where the city staff is weak, and it, it is in their trust of this council. But if you think removing these men they respect and trust will help in this regard, it will not. I hope you will be wise in the decisions you make. Thanks, Nathaniel Gee. This is from Peggy Levitt. I'm writing to you in support of Steve Morris. Steve was the assistant city attorney. I'm going to start the timer because it's long. Steve was the assistant city attorney before he became the city attorney, I believe, for five years. In that time, he earned the respect and friendship of the city employees with whom he interacted. I often heard comments about the extraordinary amount of work he was able to get done in the few hours he worked every week. In that capacity, he became familiar with all the operations of the city, in addition to knowing many of the staff. When Steve was in the acting position of city attorney, a lawyer who was representing a large consortium of developers building a wind farm in Wyoming with the intent to sell this energy to California came to me stating that negoci negotiations in Boulder City were stalled. For confidential reasons, I cannot disclose what the issue was. She requested that Steve be brought into these discussions. Boulder City was critical in these negotiations in that the energy generated by this project had to travel through the electrical juncture in El Dorado Valley. These negotiations, which were on a deadline, involved many companies and also several states. Steve was able to successfully negotiate this contract within the deadline. After this successful conclusion, the same lawyer effusively praised Steve and said that his expertise in guiding that negotiation was like unraveling a plate of spaghetti. She credited Steve for saving this huge project, which, as stated, involved millions of dollars spread over several states that got hung up in Boulder City. Steve has a reputation among staff and colleagues as being extremely smart, approachable, and being able to competently handle a huge workload. As affable as Steve is seen, he is also respected for having a backbone and always standing for what is right for the city. I feel it is important to address the controversy when Steve was hired. At that time, there was a group of people who were vehemently opposed to Steve being appointed to the position of city attorney, despite his years of experience in the city and his expertise as an attorney. Most, if not all, of this opposition surrounded Steve's religion. 
At one of the special council meetings in which we were discussing prospective candidates, Neil Sinayakin, who is a friend and associate of the mayor's, got up and said that he had called all the finalists to ask if they were Mormons. He went on to report who of the candidates was and was not a Mormon. It was his opinion that we needed more diversity on the council. Due to this unprecedented action by Mr. Sinayakin, the city had to change their hiring procedures so that the process cannot be as open and transparent as it was at one time. Despite all the falderall around this process, the council did appoint Steve as a city attorney without the votes of McManus or Warren Harhe. Warren, in fact, wrote one of the essays on Facebook after the appointment entitled Sour Grapes, stating why he did not vote for Steve. He felt at the time it reinforced the idea of collusion among the members of city council, despite Steve being the obvious choice. I explained to Warren why I voted for Steve and asked him if he had talked to any of the staff or department heads about Steve. He had not. I told him Steve should not be appointed because of who it is presumed he associates with, but on his own merits. After that, Warren did talk to Steve and removed the post on his Facebook page. They ended up having a very amicable relationship with Warren, often expressing his respect for Steve. In my opinion, another sticking point for Mayor McManus was when Ainsworth Hunt's son was arrested in a sting operation targeting jaywalkers. Ainsworth and Kiernan are friends. Steve served as a prosecutor for the city in that case. The mayor was furious with Steve over the handling of this case in which the city prevailed after a lawsuit. And in fact, when he was a council member, sat at the table with John Hunt during one of the court proceedings. I believe this was highly inappropriate behavior for a council member to be so obviously biased in a court case involving the city. So I think that Steve has been in the crosshairs of the mayor since before he was hired. Despite the constant public criticism and humiliation, he has risen about it and has continued to do a stellar job as our city attorney. He is the epitome of a professional. He is one of the most honorable people I know. His being terminated would be a huge loss for the city and community of Boulder City. When Al applied for the job of city manager, his resume stood out from all the rest. It was obvious from the very beginning of the process that he was an outstanding candidate. Al had a very impressive background of management and leadership experience, including being in the military. He had worked for the city of North Las Vegas in key leadership positions, and most recently had been city manager in a small town in California. Almost immediately when hired in California, he helped the city council craft a strategic plan in a short period of time, was able to accomplish many of the goals contained in their strategic plan. I was impressed that because of his bilingual abilities and his extraordinary work ethic, he was able to successfully work in a town of largely Hispanic immigrants. I'll, I'll just put it in the record because there's lots left. Yes, please include the rest in the record. This is from Ross Johnson regarding items 13 through 16. Now that there is a meeting to review the contracts of the city manager and the city attorney and possibly others, I would offer a comment in support of both the city manager and the city attorney. I visited City Hall and had personal dealings with both of these gentlemen. My personal experience is that they were very helpful in understanding of my concerns. They were forthright and honest in their comments. From having been around City Hall over the years, I've seen the positive effect each has brought to city staff. Both of them are a positive force in stabilizing the work environment and encourage the service and can-do attitude of city staff. It has been sad to watch the deterioration of the morale and enthusiasm around City Hall. I hope the meeting does not deteriorate to unfounded character assassinations and that is will be founded on truth. I support both of these men and appreciate their attitudes and endurance during these very trying times. I hope that they are able to continue to serve the city of Boulder City in the future. The next is from John Gustafson. Please put me down for agreeing with council for the removal of city manager Noyola and city attorney Morris and for installing their temporary replacements. I've been watching and researching the actions of these city employees and believe it's time for them to be replaced for cause. Please remove these individuals using the best legal method to prevent the unnecessary expense to the city in the form of severance and retirement. Thank you, John Gustafson. 
Next is Teresa Giroux. My name is Teresa Giroux. I live by choice in Boulder City. I was reading the news of the city council considering firing the city manager and attorney. I do not want to fire the city manager or attorney at this time. I do not want to pay their exit contract fees. I do not want to bring in new faces and have the learning curve about our town begin. I do not want to add their new salaries and pay out the other exit contracts. Different views are the American way. Freedom to express those views are the American way. As I watch the council meetings, I question freedom to speak. I read an article for all to consider for peaceful times again. The author suggested, quote, when someone offers a conflicting opinion, we can be curious instead of condemning. We can use inquiry instead of intimidation. We can use dialogue instead of debate. We can create options for action instead of opinions for arguments, end quote. If you are trying to build a brick bridge, you will never succeed by throwing the bricks. Just like the song, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. We have many problems to face in these times. We do need to address real issues. I, want to, I wanted to express my thoughts since your job is to represent all the citizens of Boulder City. Teresa Giroux. Next is from Cokie Booth. Prior to the last election, a group formed the Boulder City Alliance. Many of us went online to understand what this group was about. One of their goals was to get rid of several people at City Hall, like the city attorney and city manager. Two of the members of the BC Alliance, Mr. McManus and James Adams, did win seats. Shortly after the elections, two more seats needed to be filled and were filled by appointment rather than election. Both positions were filled with BC Alliance members and not with the person with the next highest votes by the citizens of Boulder City. Mr. McManus appointed Ms. Folda, who was the chair of the BC Alliance. Now BC Alliance City Council wants to terminate the manager and city attorney, not because their work is inferior or they have deficiencies, just because they don't like them. It seems to me that deficiencies lie with the BC Alliance City Council members. The City Council should be working for the citizens of Boulder City, not BC Alliance. What is it going to cost the citizens of Boulder City to terminate the city staff? I know this is a right to work state, but this whole thing stinks of discrimination. I consider this council illegitimate. This should be put on hold until the two appointed council members can be replaced with council members elected by the citizens of Boulder City. Koki Booth. Next is Roger Tobler for items 13 through 16. Dear Mayor and Council Members, I am writing in today to express my concerns regarding agenda items 13 and 15. As a council, you have the right to dismiss and terminate the city attorneys and city managers contracts under the conditions of those contracts. Although I disagree with your reasonings for termination, it is the process you have followed that really should be the concern. I was in your position for 12 years. I interact with the public every day and am hearing many concerned comments about what is happening. It is simply not wise to remove two essential positions at the same time, especially during our current state of affairs, and not to mention that all of you are quite new to public office. You are, re uh, you are attempting to remove two appointed positions and the council member who placed those items on the agenda was not elected. She has no mandate from the community. She, as well as council member Judith Hoskins, were appointed. I understand she has that authority to do so, but this city council has only three elected officials. It is not my intent to discredit their service during their time on the city council. The two of them were chosen because of their affiliation with the mayor and other council members, not by the vote of the people. I commend Councilwoman Bridges for taking opposing positions in prior meetings. Since Mr. Morris's character is being addressed tonight, I would like to speak to that as well. I've known Mr. Morris and has worked with him for many years. He has an excellent reputation among his peers and has done great work for the city. He has a strong moral character. To question his character is simply a ploy to nullify his current employment benefits or to hurt his reputation. Mr. Morris is a hardworking, honest individual who has served this community diligently and effectively. There are many in this community that are watching how this city council conducts business. If you want to terminate employee contracts, then do so following the correct process and without attempting to ruin their reputations. I did not personally work with the current city manager, but he also should be treated fairly. This city council, two of which were not elected, have been given a city government with a sustainable budget and major improvements. This was accomplished before your time in office. 
You may not agree with some of those who served before you, but I would ask that you honor the position you now temporarily hold. Please conduct your business tonight without making this personal or destructive of one's reputation and character and follow the correct procedures. Doing otherwise is a disservice to this community. I appreciate your service and the time you spend as a public servant. I know firsthand the demands and sacrifices you make. Thank you, Roger Tobler. This is from Joan Paolini. Regarding items 13 through 16, I have no doubt that the council will vote to remove the city attorney and the city manager. I also have no doubt that the council in appointing an acting city attorney an acting city manager will appoint someone with ties to the Boulder City Alliance. Everyone on the council needs to think and remember that you represent the entire city of Boulder City and not just a particular group. Joan Paolini. This is from Nancy Summer, retired city of Boulder City employee. Mayor and council, the city is in a state of emergency. The pandemic is still a real threat and now you want to fire the city manager and city attorney during this crisis and put in an unknown. Your actions have hurt the employees of the city who are already stressed due to the hostile work environment you created. The last thing needed right now is more uncertainty in an already chaotic situation. I have watched your attempts to systematically destroy the appointed employees and director's work, reputation and character evidenced by any number of recorded city council meetings. Your vitriol is palpable. It is well known that all of you campaigned on firing all the appointed, which fed the red meat to your BCCA sponsored base. Now you are trying to keep that campaign promise at the expense of the city's well-being. You have made a mockery of city government by creating ad hoc committees and appointing BCCA members and yourselves where you have decision-making power. which undermines the ability of city staff to perform their job. You are trying to run the city by committee, and in your arrogance, you think city staff doesn't know what you are doing. What you are doing to City Hall and the city of Boulder City is nothing short of dereliction of duty. Your actions here tonight will cause irreparable damage and most likely end your career as public officials. This is from Tanya Vici. I think the actions of Ms. Folda are disgusting in regards to item 13A, NRS 241. She of all people should be worried about alleged misconduct because I believe her actions and even her appointment are a gross abuse of power. I believe the use of NRS 241.030 is nothing more than Fulda's continued advocacy in a public office for the BCCA to weed out who they don't like and make good on backdoor promises. With the differences of opinion aside and my dislike and distrust of Ms. Fulda, this proposed action only hurts the city. A city and citizens, Ms. Fulda swore to serve when she took the oath of office. The motion with this action Ms. Fulda set into place is costing us citizens money and the city time that is wasteful. I find it ironic that Ms. Fulda was appointed to save the city money from hosting a special election and yet we have the budget for this. What an embarrassment and what an outrage. Quite frankly, this item for possible action introduced by Tracy Fulda makes me question her mental capacity. Um, that's it for items on the agenda. Um, I just have the general public comment. Thank you. Uh, with that then, if there's anyone who wishes to call in, uh, the phone number is comment yes hello this is can you hear me yes <clears throat> my name is david randall i've I'm, I'm been a resident of boulder city for the last 21 years and i wanted to make a few for share a few comments about agenda items 13 through 16 
considering Al Noyle and Steve Morris's employment with the city. Um, as has been said, I think I understand that it's well within the rights of this council to hire and fire certain appointed city staff positions. And I think, um, you know, there, there's some precedent for some turnover um, following a change in administration, but the degree to which this council is targeting staff is unprecedented, I believe. Um, besides, you know, the city manager and city attorney who are being considered tonight, the mayor has also targeted our city clerk of 14 years and our municipal court judge of 36 years. Think of that. Um, between the two of them, our city clerk and municipal judge have 50 years of service to the city. And that's twice as much, I'm guessing, as all five members of this council combined. So they have successfully served numerous administrations prior to this one. Um, and one has to ask, why is this council unable to work with such qualified and tenured professionals? I think it would have been perhaps understandable if several months ago this council had informed the city manager and city attorney that they were pursuing a different direction and no longer required their services and would honor their contracts and send them on their way. But this council has chosen to charge these employees with breach of contract to avoid having to pay costs that they're contractually obligated to, to honor. In the process, as has been said, they're exposing the city to increased legal liability and damaging the morale of city employees. Um, I'm also concerned that this council is discouraging good people in our community from continuing volunteer service to the city. Um, I think Al Goya is a good example of someone who was a great advocate for historical preservation, but was prematurely driven away by the new hostile environment that he's encountered and, and I'm sure others have encountered. I can't recall in the 21 years that I've lived here this much rancor and mistrust between city council and city staff. I believe one of the jobs of a leader is to foster unity and that's done when people are treated with dignity and respect even when we don't agree with them. The actions of, that this council are taking today undermine that unity within our city and especially among city staff. As it relates to Mr. Morris, I've known him for the whole time I've lived in Boulder City, 21 years, and I know he is a man of impeccable character and integrity, as has been said. I've, I've, uh, as an attorney, he has a reputation as a highly qualified and skilled mediator and arbitrator. And during the last three years as city attorney, I know he's worked hard to build bridges and foster unity and trust between city staff and, and council and has been successful in doing so, again, has been, as has been stated. Unfortunately, this council doesn't seem to be that interested in building bridges with staff. Those who know Steve and have worked for him know that he is transparent and fair-minded. He's a problem solver an independent and objective thinker who is focused on serving the interests of this council and this city. But more importantly, I want you to know that he is somebody that people trust and go to for advice, whether it be of a legal or a personal nature. So Steve Morris was hired as city attorney for good reason. There's no one more who's more deeply invested in Boulder City and qualified to represent the city's legal affairs than he is, period. I hope this council will will um, will honor the contracts of Al and Steve, and I'd like to echo um, Duncan McCoy's recent comments in the paper that wh whatever individual members of this city council think about the city manager and city attorney, these two officials certainly know a great deal more about the operational and legal affairs of the city than do any members of city council. Boulder City doesn't need beginners to be running the council at this time that we're we're in. I appreciate the time and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share these comments with you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to call in for public comment, our initial public comment period? The phone number is 702 589 9629.
Public comment. Yes, I have public comment. Go ahead. Good evening, Council. For the record, Fred Volts. The following comments pertain to agenda items 13 through 16. After a full year's worth of stall tactics by the city manager, city attorney, and assorted enablers, we will hopefully have a fruitful discussion about their continued viability as city employees. Beyond the three agenda items regarding their personal job performance since early 2018, there are other specific examples of stark failures by both individuals worth noting. In the case of the city manager, he and his people took no action for 13 months to reconcile and establish the precise whereabouts of over $20 million of unspent utility capital project monies. In the same vein, the city manager assembled a $230 million plus list of citywide capital projects, knowing that the city's total operating budget was just over $35 million a year and that most of these projects could never be funded. In both the capital and operating budget process conducted from late 19 to early 20, the city manager and his people issued three separate summaries where scores of columns and rows did not tie. The city manager bungled the delicate process of renegotiating hangar leases at the municipal airport, enraging the lessees, treating some lessees punitively and others with favoritism, while also engaging in overreach of his emergency powers regarding airport refueling operations. The city manager pursued the Stantec project, wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars with no actionable results given available funds, or even a complete inventory and status of all city buildings. The city manager did an end run around the council-appointed utility advisory committee and unilaterally selected a rate consultant and infrastructure consultant. The city manager openly flouts the city charter's residency requirement. Shortly after starting his job, the city manager purchased a primary residence 35 miles outside of the city boundaries. The charter's provi charter provision's intent is to ensure full-time residency, not part-time, for full city manager integration into the community. As for the city attorney, he has been repeatedly unable to present proposed contracts with accurate information as simple as the address of leased premises for the failed initiative to give the local chamber of commerce free city facilities. He maintains some sort of private law practice as a domestic professional corporation, even though the city attorney job is expressly full-time, but has never periodically disclosed his clients to the city on a confidential basis in order to establish there are no conflicts of interest. The city attorney has been unable or unwilling to personally and regularly appear in court on behalf of the city since he began the job. This is one of the core job duties. He has allowed the city clerk to repeatedly practice law by interpreting the legal meaning of the state open meeting law during public meetings, even though she is not licensed to practice Nevada law. He failed to insist upon Councilwoman Bridges complying with the same open meeting law by citing the reasons why she abstained from discussion and a vote at an August 11, 2020 city council meeting. During that meeting, he appointed an unqualified substitute attorney when an issue concerning the city attorney appeared on the agenda. The city attorney had a clear obligation to find a competent replacement and failed. The issue of job abandonment applies to both individuals. For several very vague reasons, they have failed to show up for work over the same several weeks. No individual was temporarily deputized by them to take their positions. Dereliction of duty is grounds for termination in virtually any employment relationship. Despite the poor contract drafting job by former Mayor Woodbury, a former law partner of the city attorney, grossly deficient job performance means the city can no longer afford to employ either of these individuals. Any potential severance pay should be denied and, if necessary, fought in the courts. And I would ask that these comments be added verbatim to the record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the phone line is available for anyone wishing to call during our initial public comment period. The phone number is 
Hi, uh, I'd like to speak. Go ahead. Oh, I'm on. This is Neil Seneiken, and I'm really sorry that this council has been placed in this very, very difficult position. And I respect all of the comments that have been made, but they're not based on hearing the evidence or the facts that are going to come up and people have a chance to comment on later on. I don't think it's fair to the council to be making statements and dispersions without really hearing what the council's basis is. Um, I take exception to what Peggy Levitt said, and I'm sorry that this has become twisted toward being based on religion rather than facts. I appreciate Peggy's emotionalism, and I can't really fault her for that. She's a very close friend of Steve Morris. But Peggy has to remember and understand that at the time Steve was hired, my comments were based on the hiring process, not anything to do with a very fine Mormon religion. Steve's resume was withheld from the public intentionally by city clerk Crum. She received an open meeting law violation from the Attorney General for violating state law by not releasing Steve's resume. Steve didn't have pool pack experience, nor, in the opinion of many, did he have the qualifications of Christy Kindle. Christy Kindle's resume somehow got lost, even though her cover letter came in. So the process of Steve's hiring was flawed because it was done illegally in violation of the open meeting law, as documented by 138972432 at the time of his hiring. Things that I object to with Steve's opinion on his conduct he didn't disclose all of the properties that he owned in Boulder City at the time. He owned at least a dozen homes that he should have made known because they may have interfered with his legal judgment. He didn't disclose his airplane while looking at the airport matters. He didn't disclose that his son worked for the city, which is a charter violation. He didn't disclose that he bullied John Schultz, uh, Shields he sent letters to John Shields' employees mercilessly because John Shields had the audacity to stand up to him on a different matter. So for Peggy Levitt to bring up religion and to blame me on that basis, when my objections were based on Mrs. Crum being dishonest and was Tammy McKay, as was Mayor Woodbury at the time of the hiring by hiding Steve's resume against the law, these are the things that I objected to. I've been to the Mormon church with Bruce Woodbury and Rose. I find it a very fine institution. I respect the Mormon people. And I've tried to explain to Steve the benefits of Jacob too, that gaining all the money in the world and losing your soul isn't the best way to go. But I just wanted to make that clear to Peggy, and I understand her emotionalism, and my view on Steve's hiring has absolutely nothing to do with religion whatsoever, and for her to throw mud, um, I understand her emotionalism and her appreciation for Steve. As for this council, I had a conversation with Mr. McManus about a year and a half ago, and we were discussing things with the city manager and the city attorney that I had brought up. And I cautioned Mr. McManus then that if he didn't re do reviews, he would wind up in a position where Mr. Morris would wind up filing a wrongful termination suit. Mr. McManus, under the open meeting law, is allowed to nod, say yes, and remember the conversation we had at the hotel and at my living room. I'm not surprised by what Steve has done. I'm not surprised what Hallie and Celia have done by not reporting that Mr. Noyola and Mr. Morris have been in hiding for three weeks. I'm not surprised of any of this. But all I ask is that everybody wait and hear what's being presented and then make a decision. You don't make a decision before you hear the matters at hand. So I thank the council for this time. I'm really sorry that you're in this position. 
position. And I would ask Mr. Morris to just bow out gracefully um, based on the wishes of the council. He's an at-will employee. There shouldn't be any dispersions on either side. It should just be a parting of the waves if that's what this city council feels. I appreciate the time, and I'm sorry that this council and the public has been placed in this position by the antics and the hiding of Mr. Mino Mr. Noyola and Mr. Morris. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make public comment? Uh, the line is available now. Uh, public comment during the initial period is for items on the agenda. The phone number is 702. 589-9629. Public comment. Public comment. The line is available if anyone wishes to call in, the phone number 702-589-9629. Yes, I'd like to make public comment, please. Uh -huh. Hi, this is Judy D. Shane, and I want to make public comment on item 13 and 15. If it were not for the hard-working council members we have, we would have had a contract go to a non-licensed city contractor. We would have had a very poorly written contract for airport hangar leases. We would have spent approximately $250,000 on two road rebuilds that primarily would benefit the city attorney's family vacant two-acre plot of land. We would have continued to pay out the additional seventy eight to eighty thousand dollars on the city manager's pet pet excuse me stand tech contract after the COVID hit and everybody in the city was asked to take a look and cut where they could and he did not bring that up. We do not have a report, and City Council does not approve the percentage pay increases that always came before the Council generally in July since Mr. Noyola has been City Manager. So we have not had a Citizens Audit Committee review and report since Mr. Noyola took over, even though there was a $3 million adjustment in the utility fund for the 17 and 18 fiscal year that appeared on the 18-19 audit. And we have not gotten an explanation for the $20 million apparent discrepancy on the utility capital fund despite it being brought to Mr. Noyola's attention multiple times for over a year. Mr. Noyola trying to usurp council authority by threatening an airport committee member for expressing his personal views on the airport hangar issue. Mr. Noyola and Mr. Morris tried to institute new rules at the airport when the airport was totally closed down and the issue was still in court so nothing should could should change until 
that case is decided. Incompetence or flat out trying to circumvent the legal system, this was not acceptable behavior. The changes were not presented to airport committee or city council prior to this action. From my reading of reports in the paper of council, of council accident accidents to Noyola and Morris, for plaintiffs will automatically win, and that's probably why they tried to put it in while the council was, or while the city was shut down. Mr. Noel and Mr. Morris using city resources to put their personal views and side of the story in the local newspaper by all the quotes from the uh, city clerk and the county, or excuse me, the city uh, resource officer and Mr. Mr. Morris and Mr. Noyola contact conduct in October of 2019, insisting that council had no right to use outside council or question their contracts or advise or advise causing and it caused an open meeting law complaint to be filed, which prevented the council from doing anything until the results of that complaint was settled at the state. The continued conduct of Mr. Noyola and Mr. Morris to stop council from looking at into their continued employment by filing suits against the council and city Excuse me, I'm losing my track here. So that everything would fall under that six-month waiver they put into their contracts. Note, a primary in April 21st will not happen unless five or more citizens decide to run for council. And we won't know that until January of 21. So the fact that April 6th and October 6th are drop dead dates isn't quite factual. These are not all of my observations, and I'm not an attorney. So Mr. Noel and Mr. Morris' actions might be legal, but the substance of their actions and words leads to a strong belief that neither of them are acting in the best interests of Boulder City residents. We should not allow their behavior to be rewarded by continuing to employ them at an inflated salary and benefits. Ms. DeSant Thank Ms. you for your time. All right. Thank you. Hey, the phone line is available. Anyone wishing to make comment during the initial public comment period, the phone number is taking my call, Russell Nelson. I have to apologize to the city clerk for a comment I made at the last meeting where I didn't believe that she received an email, but I've now discovered that the email server uh, denied the email to be sent out due to security reasons. So I apologize for that. But I'd like to talk about Mr. Morris, the city attorney this evening. Um, I'd like to use a few words to describe him. Legal malpractice, breach of fiduciary duty, negligence, intentional, tortious interference with contract, abusive process, conversion, unjust enrichment. Now, these aren't my words that I'm using to describe. 
These are words from a lawsuit that many of you do not know about, and Mr. Morris is personally being sued. I'm surprised this lawsuit hasn't been brought up, or it has been discussed and studied at the J. Rubin Clark Law School in Utah. I presented it to my students for uh, educational study. And it's our opinion when this is fully adjudicated that Mr. Morris may be disbarred for his actions that are alleged in this lawsuit with the district court, Clark County, Nevada. So I wouldn't worry too much whether Mr. Morris is going to be uh, still employed next week, next month, next year by the city council. I'd be more worried if I was Mr. Morris, if I was still going to be allowed to practice law in the state of Nevada. If you haven't read this lawsuit, I encourage everyone to look it up, see what Mr. Morris is being accused of. And I'd also like to know why his contract allows him to practice his private practice in the city building. I'd also like to know if his law clerk is being paid from city funds to work on Mr. Morris's personal lawsuit. I want to thank you for your time tonight, and I will continue to watch the meeting. Have a good evening. Thank you. The phone line is now available. Anyone watching to speak may call in. Yes, I have a public comment. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Igor Sushko, and I, my comment is very brief. Please take note on how essentially all comments against the firing of the city attorney and manager are unspecific, vague in nature, and use generalizations, and especially the same exact talking points with the same exact keywords. This is clear evidence of an orchestrated propaganda campaign by certain members of this community against the members of this council. Some even included threatening language. On the other hand, please observe how the comments made in support of firing these individuals are full of substantiated facts and details of these individuals' wrongdoing, which are absolutely damning, certainly ethically, but also very probably legally. I commend this council for their hard work, and please remember Colonel Whitman's words. In this country, Right matters. Godspeed to you all. Thank you. Thank you. The phone line is now available. The phone number is This is our initial public comment period. Anyone wishing to speak may call now at 
The initial public comment period is available now. Anyone wishing to call in, the phone number is 702 <laughs> Public comment. Uh, yes, my name is Glenn Fain. I'd like to make a public comment. Okay, public comment period is available now. Anyone wishing to call in? The phone number is Go ahead. Yes, um, I would like to, you know, when the council goes to the point of approving the agendas and stuff like that, I would like to see them adjust the agenda and move items, you know, 11 through 15, up to the first item discussed. And just to get get this whole mess over with, uh, if just possible, if it's procedurally possible, just skip A, B, and C and just go right to D and each of the two items concerning the mayor and the city attorney. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this is our initial public comment period. The phone number is 702-589-9629. Public comment. Hi, this is Deborah Finnegan, 40 year resident of Boulder City. I want to just, uh, talk about 13 to 16 tonight. I want to just say that the majority of people didn't like what, ha what was happening five or six years ago. We got rid of uh, all the incumbents. And it was so obvious to me, for someone that for 40 years been watching, going to meetings, it was so obvious to me that the city attorney, the city manager, and the city clerk weren't happy with this election results. And I, I just want to say that we hired them to do a job, and I hope they do their job tonight. Thank you. Thank you. This is our initial public comment period. The phone line is now available. The phone number is 702-589-9629. Anyone wishing to speak in the initial public comment period, the phone number is 702 <laughs> Public comment. Hello? Public comment. Hi. Um, for the record, my name is Leah Magana. 
I'm calling to comment on agenda items 13 and 15. Uh, the city council has the right to fire the city manager and city attorney, and they should. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Phone lines now available. Anyone wishing to speak in public comment? The phone number is 702 Again, this is our initial public comment period. The phone line is available if anyone wishes to speak. The number is The initial public comment period is open. The phone line is available. The phone number is 702-589-9629. Hearing no others then for the initial public comment period, uh, we will close the public comment period and move to the uh, approval of the agendas. I do want to point out that uh, City Manager uh, Noyola is on the phone line, uh, having called into the meeting this evening. Uh, for the regular agenda, Madam City Clerk, do you have any changes? No changes. Uh, Mr. City Manager? Mr. City Attorney? Um, with respect to the regular agenda, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, I do need to disclose once again that with respect to agenda items on the uh, regular agenda 13 through 16, um, that uh, as a result of a conflict, I will not be participating in those agenda items. And um, Ms. Uh, Lauren Oliver, uh, is um, appointed as the acting city attorney as to those items. However, with respect to the regular uh, agenda items 1 through 12, I have no further changes. Thank you. And Ms. Oliver, what is your position with the city? 
Good evening, Mayor. I am the paralegal for the city attorney's office. All right. Are you employed as an attorney for the city? I am not. I've been asked to appear tonight, though, in that position. Thank you. Bring it back to council then. Uh, any, Mr. Mayor, Ms. Mr. Mayor, Mr. City Manager, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. I did. Uh, I did uh, uh, forget to disclose that I also will not be participating in items 13 through 16. I have previously provided the council a uh, acting city manager um, uh, appointment to Mr. Bryce. Uh, and I will not be participating in either one of those items. However, I am available and will continue to be available through uh, items up through 12. And Mr. Bryce Bolt's uh, position with the city? Uh, he is the acting city manager for items 13 through 16. However, he is the director of administrative services and HR director uh, for the city. Thank you. All right, again, uh, any changes from council members? No council changes. member Bridges? No changes, thank you. Council member Folda? For the consent, not for regular, thank you. Thank you. No changes. All right, entertain a motion then for acceptance of Mayor, the regular agenda. Excuse me, I do have a recommendation as acting city attorney for items 13 through 16. I'm recommending the removal of items 14 and 16 in order to stay in accordance with NRS 241.020. Are you offering legal advice at this time regarding the open meeting law? No, I'm recommending the removal of those items. So I can just say that. I'm recommending the removal of items 13 through 16 at this time. And your basis for doing so? For 14 and 16, my basis is 241.020, 2D5. And if you are not to proceed on those items, I'm recommending that we don't proceed on 13 and 15 until those items can be corrected. Again, what, what is the basis? I, I appreciate you've cited a section of the law. What is your basis for doing so? My basis for doing so is items 14 and 16 per the statute are required to name the person that would be appointed and that name is not provided on the agenda and it's not provided in the backup material and the NRS does require that name to be provided. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'll entertain a motion then to approve the agenda as written, the regular agenda. Mayor, I'll move to approve the regular agenda. Do we have a second? I'll second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We'll move to the consent agenda. Madam City Clerk, any changes? Yes, Mayor. Staff is recommending uh, the removal of item number three, and that will be brought back at the next City Council meeting. And I just wanted to note that there is a typo on item five with respect to the amendment. It should read 20-1877A, and that's just simply a typo, and we'll, um, it, it's already been corrected for signature if it is approved, and we'll go into the record correctly. Thank you. That, that's the agreement number you're referring to? Yes. Thank you. Mr. City Manager, any changes for the consent agenda? No further agenda? changes. Thank you. No further changes. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney? No additional changes, Mayor. Thank you. Bring it back to council for any changes to the consent agenda. Council member Folda? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to move item number five to the regular agenda, please. Any other changes? Entertain a motion then uh, with the amendment to move item five to the regular agenda. I'd like to make a motion to accept the consent agenda, moving item number five to the regular agenda. Thank you. And removal of item number three. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, we will move then to item number five. Mr. Luttrell. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Item number five is an agreement with uh, Par Electrical Contractors for construction services for the BC TAP Buchanan overhead line. And as Madam City Clerk mentioned, that the agreement number is 20-1877A. Uh, to give a little background, uh, staff and myself did a thorough RFP process over the winter to uh, hire a consultant, a uh, construction company to do the design work for the BC TAP overhead project. And that was signed an agreement, uh, the original agreement back in March of 2020. The reason this is split into two different portions is PAR suggested that they at least get to 60% design before they can give us a firm number on what the construction services are gonna cost. Um, so they have reached the 60% design here recently, so that's why we're bringing this forward to you. The additional money for the construction services is around $9 million, of which we're asking for 950,000 to be taken from the, um, the available cash out of the electric fund. You'll see on page 244, there's a table there showing that the operating reserve of 2.1 is still available, and then there's available cash of 2.5, so we're asking out of that 2.5 to be able to use 950,000. And then uh, of that 950, the 250 that was in next year's CIP will no longer be in there. That'll be a portion of that 950. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Questions or comments? Council Member Folda. Um, I have some comments. Um, I discussed this, so hopefully this won't be any shocking surprises, but um, this project, I have a concern with the um, the contract of this uh, attached to this project. Um, under the scope of work, um, there's really nothing in the contract for this project. This was done as a design build, and so um, as such, it was not brought originally before council, but this was signed off administratively. Um, and now it's going to be, you know, eventually a $9 million build. The design, I believe, is at, um, not complete yet, which we thought it would be at this point, correct? No, we wanted to wait till they get to their 60%, and that's when they could give us the firm number for construction. Okay, but when is, when was the design originally on the contract to be? Yeah, you're, you're correct on that part. Uh, it, originally, it was supposed to be October, I believe. Uh, staff has asked for um, them to do some power electrical to do some value engineering to try to shorten up the line, look at some different routes, so that extended the, the duration of the design. Okay, thank you. Um, so the attachment from Power Electric was part of the um, paperwork submitted last October 2019 with the RFP. So at this point, we don't have yet um, what the project scope is. And so my concern was moving forward on approving this project without having in the contract what they're supposed to be doing and what our role in this contract and build is. So. Yes, and as we discussed yesterday, it was a good recommendation that once they do get to the 100% design, um, we can do an amendment to add the 100% the plans and the specifications showing exactly what we want. Um, in the original agreement, it spells out that, um, that they're going to do the design that the city requires. So that would play right into what you were asking for during the briefings. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, you know, I, I had mentioned in my briefing as well that uh, we, we know that the utility system has been neglected for a very long period of time. Uh, getting these big projects done is important, but we seem to get into situations where, you know, projects that were promised some time ago, uh, budgeted each year, never completed, never started, uh, kept rolling forward, rolling forward, and we get to this situation where I think, as Council Member Folda pointed out, um, the cost seems to escalate. Uh, it puts a hole in our capital improvement projects. Um, you know, we're, we're fortunate that uh, that particular fund has enough money to do these things, but. Uh, we're also putting a burden on the current ratepayers to catch up on a lot of these projects. So, 
Um, you know, I do understand the necessity of these things, but I, I think working with the Utility Advisory Committee, we need to get a better look at how these projects are going to fit in, uh, how we might be able to do these in such a way that uh, we're not always getting into more and more money, and I, I mean significant amounts of money for it. Any other questions or comments? Anyone wishing to make a motion? Uh, Mayor, I would like to um, move to uh, approve this agreement. If I can find the number. Technically, no, two zero dash. No, would be a resolution then. Uh, move to approve resolution seventy one sixty five, um, but to um, bring back this item to, or to amend the contract when the design portion of this project agreement is complete. Okay, so that would be amending the contract number 20-1877A to reflect the 100% design? To amend the scope of work and the contract in this agreement. All right. It, is that sufficient, uh, Madam City Clerk? Yep. Okay. I'll second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Mr. Luttrell. Thank you. We move now to item number seven, introduction of bill number 1887. Anyone wishing to introduce that bill? Mayor, I'll introduce bill number 1887. Uh, read the title, uh, wave reading. Bill number 1887, an ordinance of the city of Boulder City, Nevada, to amend Title 11, Chapter 23 of the city code regarding the parking paving standards for individual single family lots or mobile home sites, AM 20-353. Bill 1887 will be considered at the October 27th regular city council meeting. Thank you. Item number eight, we have a presentation by Mr. Jaime Cruz with Workforce Connections. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Thank you. Uh, I say this every time I visit you, and, and I mean it, it's true. I'm always impressed with the high level of civic engagement of this community. Uh, I also think I'm really lousy at picking what meeting I asked you to <laughs> attend. So I'm gonna work on that. Um, but with that said, we're very thankful that you made room for us. Uh, we're also thankful for Councilwoman Hoskins' service on Workforce Connections Local Elected Officials Consortium. I know uh, the pandemic has affected us in many ways, uh, but we came tonight to share with you what, what progress we have made. Uh, you, you've heard me say multiple times, I love coming to Boulder City, driving from my home in Henderson to visit Tony's, Jack's, Milo's, sometimes all in one night. Um, but this morning, as we prepare for this update, my colleague, Irene Bustamante Adams, come on up, shared a story with me that I thought you would enjoy hearing. So uh, she's gonna start, uh, share that story with you, start up our presentation, and then she'll ask me to come in whenever she needs me. So. Thank you, uh, mayors and, and council members. Irene Bustamante Adams, for the record, I get to serve uh, as deputy director for the local workforce board. And I was sharing with Jaime that October is an amazing month for me and my family. I get to celebrate my anniversary, my birthday, and other major milestones. And so we chose to uh, tour Boulder City and take advantage of a lot of the restaurants, attractions that you have here. And we have been in awe. It has been amazing. And thanks to the councilwoman and uh, former councilman Jorge, uh, president and CEO of the Boulder City Chamber of Commerce, Jill, you guys have all been great ambassadors of what you have here and uh, the hidden treasures. And so it has been an amazing two weeks. And tonight we're back again 
as soon as this is done, we are planning a family dinner. And so next month, we plan on bringing um, our extended family that are gonna be visiting to come back. And just, just wanna say thank you for helping us to create great memories and for you know, helping us to understand the value of the businesses that you have here in this uh, beautiful town. So just thank you. I'm gonna start our presentation. So we have several updates, like um, Jaime said, that we wanna share with you on a lighter note and some great positive things. Um, as you know, our role here is to be the one-stop delivery uh, convener of 17 partners. Our two customers are job seekers and also uh, employers. Uh, this is a, a visual of the 17 partners. We are one of them. Um, our amount of money is about 20 million. And uh, together, collectively though, uh, we have between 120 and 140 millions to be able to serve Nevadans. This shows a different visual picture that shows we are uh, pillar number one, which is about 20%. But there's also other players like Dieter, the Department of Education, and the Department of Health and Human Services that play a very vital role. We are not mandated to play in the same sandbox together, but because of leadership under Jaime and others, um, that is happening in our state, which is really refreshing. We partnered with you uh, to uh, have a one-stop career center at the Boulder City Library. And even though because of COVID, um, there are restrictions, we are still providing services uh, virtually. And in addition, we're partnering like with um, our Councilwoman Hoskins on our board to do virtual job fairs, one that's coming up on November 5th, which we're super excited. The first update I want to share is about our work ready communities. Uh, if you remember when we were, we were here a couple of months ago, it's an initiative to develop an inventory of the workforce skill set in our uh, Southern Nevada region. That's how I describe it. And what we did is we created a new tool for employers, for your businesses, and that's called job profiling. It is um, a tool that employers can use to be able to hire the right worker the first time. We all know that there's cost associated when that happens, when that does not happen. And so what we did is invested in 12 individuals within this region to be able to become um, certified through the ACT Work Ready Communities. And, and so we are excited about deploying that resource. And what's good news for you is that it's no cost uh, to the employer. The other great news is uh, these two individuals, um, uh, Jake is on the left and uh, George is on the right. We as a board made a decision to uh, embed subject matter experts at LVGA and the Vegas Chamber. And why is this important for you? It's because for, um, for many years, uh, workforce was not a competitive advantage at the table when we were trying to recruit, retain, or expand uh, existing businesses. This effort allows us that opportunity. And as we roll back because of budget cuts and aren't able to offer incentives for companies to move here, this becomes one of the greatest tools that we could offer to the table. This is offered, these individuals will work in helping uh, the Regional Development Economic Authority and other chambers to be able to do uh, that for your businesses. Jake has already started down that path. He's worked with Jill from the Boulder City Chamber through our layoff aversion pilot to help employers keep their employees on uh, during this pandemic. And there's gonna be so much more coming down through the pipeline with these two individuals. The last thing before I switch it over to Jaime is our employee envy business hubs. Why is this important? It's because I shared earlier that we have job seekers and employers as our customers. This is for the employers. It's the first 
of its kind in the nation to focus on employers and the resources that they need from the public workforce system. You saw that visual earlier where it's a very chaotic map of the 17 partners. These business hubs allow the employers to get those services under one umbrella. We just opened and launched the first one at the Vegas Chamber. They gave us the space. Um, and the second one will open up uh, next week at the Sahara West Library down in Summerlin. They also gave us a free space. We don't have to pay rent or utilities. And it's a way for us to uh, leverage our dollars uh, that the taxpayers give us. We're super excited about these employee business hubs. Like I said, first of its kind in the nation, and it's under leadership like Jaime and others that have brought this to fruition for Southern Nevada. I'll turn it over to Jaime. Thank you, Irene. Did you guys like her story? <laughs> I like this. I said, you got to get up there. So um, I think she, she covered that part. So, oh, where am I? Over here. Um, I won't go into big details, but I want you to know that the pandemic has forced us to, of course, adjust. And so some part of the adjustment is to request waivers of existing policies that were created before this pandemic and don't apply to today's situation. So we've applied for waivers and gotten some, waiting for some, all in the effort to be able to be more effective with the dollars. And so uh, one that I will share with you that's very important is there used to be a 20% limitation on current staff levels to do this very valuable tool called OJT. What does that mean? It means that these employers that we've helped stay in business until now with layoff aversion strategies, when they get ready to hire again, we can really help them by covering a portion of those uh, wages, if you will, for the first few weeks of employment. And that translates to uh, a, a a lot of help for an employer that's trying trying to reboot and grow again. So the problem that is it was limited to 20% of their staff. So if you had 100 people, we could do 20. If you had 10, we can do two. If you could do five, we could do one. The problem is a lot of our businesses have less than five employees. And so that's a limitation that doesn't exist in federal law. And we as a state self-restricted. So we were able to move it uh, a notch, if you will. Now we can help the businesses that have five and four. We're still leaving out the businesses that have three, two, and one. So uh, we, we would love your help with the, again, this happens at the Governor's Workforce Development Board. We have business members on that board that have advocated for this to go away. Any uh, help that you could give on that, we would appreciate it. So. With that, I'll go to, and if you want more details about the waivers, I will give them to you. We also, as a state, received something called the National Emergency Grant, which is going to bring about $12 million more to our state, uh, of 70% of which will come here to Southern Nevada. Again, this is that on-the-job training that really affects micro-businesses, the largest portion of our economy. Uh, we talked about the business hubs, which are going to be hosted, hosted at the Vegas Chamber and the Sahara West Library. They are important because they bring, again, multiple, fundings, uh, multiple funding streams to under one roof to serve the business. These career hubs are uh, uh, that same idea, if you will, but they're going to be tailored to the, the people that are at CSN, so young students or older students that are at those colleges uh, looking to, again, to reenter the workforce. So this is, is a new effort that's happening over the next few weeks. This is who we're targeting. And what are we working on next? Just to share with you, we have a summer uh, youth employment program that we're starting to build, again, for the long run for next year. We're trying to get better at youth. Uh, we've done really well in, in bringing some of those funding streams you saw earlier together. We can do better on the youth side, and we're working on that. And then again, as uh, Irene mentioned, we are really heavy now into this virtual world of job fairs, career fairs, and also meetings for youth with companies that are looking for workers. We also have a pilot with the Department of Health and Human Services in Clark County to train people to do childcare, which is a need that's happening uh, a lot more lately now. And the last thing I think we wanna share with you, in, in case uh, you haven't um, heard, every year, just like the 32 teams of the NFL, they all uh, strive to win the Vince Lombardi, or our Golden Knights uh, fight, fight to get to the Stanley Cup, the 550 local workforce development boards like us across the nation vie for a what's called the Lori Moran Partnership Award. It's awarded to one board out of the 550, so many have to wait 
many years, we say half a millennium, to get this award. Uh, I'm proud to, to share with you that we were the recipients of this award uh, this year, and it rewards the board that best advances workforce and economic development in their region. So again, uh, we're, we're proud of this, We've, and we want you to know Boulder City is important to us. Hopefully you see it in our actions, not just by us being here, but by the projects that we work with you on, and we're open ears to hear how we can do better. So that's it. That's our quick update. We'd be glad, glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Questions or comments? Councilman Adams. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, uh, absolutely, for your uh, award. I think it's, it's absolutely awesome uh, what you guys do. You certainly deserve it. I know I have met uh, individuals in this community uh, who have gone through your program uh, and are, are absolutely a success, and, and uh, I think uh, they show exactly what you guys do and what you can accomplish. You guys did touch on it a little bit. Obviously, uh, with the pandemic, a lot of things have had to change. Um, I think it's, it's pretty clear that um, there's going to be an increased need um, for your guys' services um, in the coming months, uh, unfortunately, maybe even years. Uh, I, I hope that's not true, but uh, your services are definitely going to be required. What um, preparations uh, have you guys been able to make or have you begun undertaking in order to try and maybe meet that demand that we're unfortunately likely going to see in, in the coming time? That's an excellent question. I'll start and then Irene can jump in and add. But, you know, again, I think we pointed at it earlier. We believe the most significant way we can help our, our Southern Nevada community is if all those partners that receive monies work better together. Because we believe, and when we have now cases that prove that, data that shows that when we work together, we leverage the funding, we can go farther. And so that's something that we're really striving to do. We've made significant progress, but there is more opportunity there. So that, I would say, is one of our biggest focuses. Uh, I would like to add that one of, one of the things that we have done better is working with the local chambers of commerce. We had a relationship, we had a partnership, but because of the pandemic, we were able to pilot the layoff aversion um, initiative that we had uh, mentioned to be able to intimately know your businesses through their perspective and giving the chamber an opportunity to talk about our resources. So expanding the network of people that know the services that we provide, that to me has been the most priceless relationships that we have in, in the last six months developed. And that extends to Boulder City, to Mesquite, to Laughlin, uh, they have become our voice so that we don't, uh, it's beyond just our staff talking about what we can offer. Thank you. I think it just goes to show just how far uh, communication and cooperation can really go and, and what you can accomplish. So I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Hoskins? Yes, I would just say I'm thrilled to be with you guys. Um, you make me feel like a family. Uh, we all just seem like we're brothers and sisters. I, I'm probably your mother. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate everything you're doing, and it's very exciting. And I'm looking forward to that virtual job fair on November the 5th, which we'll be getting out more information on. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you. Thank you. Councilmember Bridges. Yes, hi. Um, well, congratulations, first of all, on that award. That's wonderful. And. Uh, I think there's, it seems like there's going to be a lot more demand. I guess my, my interest is in cross-training, where you have, you know, you talked about on-the-job training is cross-training people who are coming out of careers that they may not be going back to for a very, very long time, and coming and saying, okay, now what do I do? And have you started to receive those kinds of requests, and, and what do you do about that? You know? Yeah, that is the equation to solve. You're absolutely right, and if it was easy, um, well, we probably wouldn't have jobs, <laughs> but um, yes, uh, to all of that, I think the foundation I read and explain is uh, much needed, meaning that we have to start on the demand side. Uh, we, be we believe that employers are the ones that tell us what their worker needs to look like, what, the, what they need to be skilled in, what certificates they need to hold, how they need to be prepared for the workplace, and then we can... Uh, walk that back, engineer that back into this pipeline that, by the way, doesn't just start in the community college or high school, uh, it starts early in the pipeline. And so another, I think, success that we can add uh, to what we've done well and what we hope will help us solve this, Councilwoman, is 
Uh, we have the superintendent of schools on our board and the president of the community college and the president of multiple chambers. So that is what we're working on. As you know, we shared with you the Workforce Blueprint 2.0 last time. It's a start. And as the mayor knows, because he sits with me on the LVGA board, we really want to be a board that, that tailors our workforce development efforts and money and investment to what you just said, the need. And it's going to be, a, I keep walking away, a different need than it was before the pandemic. And we don't know yet what that is exactly, but we know it's going to be different, but we are focused on that to make sure that we meet that new demand. Member Folda. Thank you. Um, congratulations again on your award. And um, I just want to say what an asset having um, a little branch here in our library has been. And hopefully we can get that going up again soon. Um, I know that Warren Hare loved being a part of Workforce mm -hmm. for Connections and that um, what you, the work that you do, I met Jaime, I met with Jaime before. And just it's really the work that you do is, is really great and beneficial to our community as well as the valley, Vegas Valley. So thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you, Mayor and, and Council, for allowing us to come honor Warren um, when you did, because he meant a lot to us, too. Um, we, you know, we're, we're again, it, we thought it was going to be uh, hard to fill his shoes, but you're doing a great job. So <laughs> we miss him. We do miss him. Well, thank you. And again, you know, with the pandemic, we've seen unemployment numbers just ac absolutely go through the roof. You know, fortunately, they are coming back down. But, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, people may have to change careers. And I think that's where workforce connections can really be a benefit for the community. So again, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for letting us know about your services. And I know Council Member Hoskins will uh, keep us informed. Thank you. All right, we'll move to item number nine, uh, resolution 7167, creation of a subcommittee, an ad hoc committee for historic preservation. We have Mr. Mays. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. The uh, Historic Preservation Committee had requested that the uh, City Council take into consideration the creation of an ad hoc committee, the purpose of which would be to review Title 11, Chapter 27 of the City Code, which addresses historic resources uh, within the community. At the September 22nd City Council meeting, the um, City Council directed staff to proceed with the creation of the ad hoc committee. In front of you is a resolution, uh, 7167, which lays out the parameters for the ad hoc committee. It would meet monthly to discuss recommended changes to the city code as it relates to historic resources. It would constitute the five members of the Historic Preservation Committee, as well as two members of the city council. And with that, I can uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? Council Member Adams? I guess I'll just add this comment um, that um, I just want to say that I believe that this committee will, will absolutely be a benefit to this community in helping to provide transparency in uh, the process for achieving uh, our historic preservation goals. And I think that's, that's really important. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I. I one, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think the Preservation Committee has been uh, frustrated in not being able to see things move forward with that committee. And this is, I'm sure, their attempt uh, to get that moving uh, with regard to changes to our city code. Um, there are a couple of things, though, that, that I think we could change that would make this committee more efficient. Uh, when we look at the number of committee members, I really do feel that if we were to make that two council members and two preservation committee members, uh, that would make this committee a little more efficient. Uh, you know, the preservation committee meets on its own each month. Uh, they can certainly discuss these issues and make recommendations, but I think it would be a lot more efficient 
if they do that and then this ad hoc committee uh, can spend time really trying to narrow in on, on what is necessary with the code. Uh, the other item is, well, a couple of other items here. Uh, it talks in, this is 2C, the committee's duties will conclude and the committee will be dissolved on December 31, 2021. Um, I think we could change that to, or when recommendations to council have been accepted. So if they can complete their work in three months or nine months, uh, would not necessarily need to continue on. As far as the number of meetings, uh, that's in item number three. They're talking about monthly meetings. I see a problem with that in the way that the council meets and the way that this committee, the preservation committee meets. I'm afraid that what would happen because of the time necessary to agendize recommendations and all of that, there would be potentially months where this ad hoc committee wouldn't really have any anything they could discuss because things had not worked through the process on the others. So my suggestion would be to change that rather than a monthly meeting to meeting at least once every three months. And if they felt the, the need to do it more often, that certainly could be a decision that would be made by that ad hoc committee. So it wouldn't prohibit them from meeting more often, but I'm just afraid there would be times where because of the way agendas work and the notice that's needed and you know posting agendas and all of that, uh, it's possible that this committee would get together and have nothing they could discuss. Uh, under 3B, again, uh, suggesting that the number of committee members be changed to four rather than seven. And then number five, uh, again, changing that uh, date when the committee would complete its work to just state or until the city council has determined the committee has completed work. So if they're able to make their recommendations uh, prior to December of 2021, then there would be no reason for this committee to meet any longer. Any discussion regarding those changes? Council Member Bridges? Yeah, um, I do have a comment. I, when you brought up that number, the two and the two, I, I wanted to say that I, uh, I'm opposed to the idea of having members of the council on the committee, which I'm sure will um, put me in a position of not being one of the favorites to be on the committee. Um, I think the deliberations between the council and the committee should be with the committee and the council and not within uh, that ad hoc group. Uh, this way the council ends up directing the policy and I believe that the committee needs to be developing a policy to present to the council should be independent of the council. In the event we do agree to have two members of the council on that committee, I believe that the committee itself, the Historic Preservation Committee, the five members should be on there. To me, having half and half uh, looks more like a council-driven uh, set of policies, and I, I like the idea of policies that come from our ad hoc and standing committees uh, should be developed within them for approval or amending uh, the way they're written. That's it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Fold? Thank you. I just wondering, uh, just further on those um, comments, Council Member Bridges just made. Um, how do you pro do? You have any suggestions in that? Because um, without having council members and just five members of the Historic Preservation Committee, we already have a committee like that, and it's called the Historic Preservation Committee. So I don't see the point of having an ad hoc committee if we're just going to have the Historic Preservation Committee um, be working on this um, particular item. I think the point of this was to have people that um, could make recommendations um, to the council, um, but be able to work on it um, without having um, all ten members of the, both you know groups together. I'm, and I, I understand that perspective, and I would be willing to accept the five and two. 
but I think having half and half is weighs it towards what is it that the council would want, uh, as opposed to a independent perspective of the committee. I know it's on, it's sitting down and and looking at existing. Uh, code, existing policy, and, and creating effective policy. Uh, I'm just not comfortable with the idea of two and two um, being an independent ad hoc committee. Mayor, may, may I uh, just bring up a point? Of course, you can create the committee that you want, but when Committees are usually established. It's always at an odd number for purposes of when you vote and it's a 2-2 tie, then the motion dies. So you, you might have a, you know, um, a, a split vote on a lot of items, which that means they don't go forward. It's just something to consider. And, and I do understand that, um, but I think too that that it may help to address some of the concerns that Council Member Bridges brought up. Uh, the, the purpose of something like this, uh, an ad hoc committee, uh, is not necessarily to make determinations, but more to make recommendations. And, uh, you know, they can certainly submit a report that would reflect more than one perspective uh, without having to vote and, and make a, a determination on one issue or the other. Uh, I, I think the idea of this is to be just what they've said here is an advisory committee. Uh, certainly the preservation committee can meet on its own. They do that monthly. Uh, I know they've talked about this because I served on the committee uh, four years ago and it was certainly a topic that we discussed often and unfortunately we're never able to get much movement. And I think one of the ways to get that movement is to have members of the council on that committee uh, that they can then bring things forward to the council agendas more quickly, more readily uh, than what has been happening in the past uh, to try and get this moving. And I think that's the whole point of this is to get the process moving. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Hoskins? I uh, guess um, there are five members on the uh, Historic Preservation Committee, correct? There are five members on the council, so if you take two from one and two from the other, then we're not overburdening or overlaying. So I think that would be the way to go. Council, council Member you. Adams? Um, I, I'm, I'm a little torn on this one. Um, on the one hand, I believe part of the intention of the Historic uh, Preservation Committee was because they wanted everybody on there because they wanted to be sure that everybody was included in the conversation. And I think it at least helps keep it from uh, having the appearance that only a certain number of them are driving these issues, even though, of course, it's, it's recommendation. I understand the, the formation. At the same time, I do also understand the idea of a, a two and two uh, model in that um, it's not a, a quorum of, of either uh, committee or, or council is on there, so it kind of helps prevent from seeing it as being uh, lopsided or one-sided, so I, that's why I see as either, either the five or the two. I, I do have a question with the two as far as a quorum goes and uh, uh, issues of open meeting law and, and you know, having discussions or whatever. Uh, would those members with, you know, a quorum I assume would be three then out of a four, and so two members could still discuss. They wouldn't somehow limit themselves down to not being able to discuss uh, potentially with, with one other member on that committee. Okay, I just, I just want to be sure that we don't create a, a situation in which they, because I know that that is also uh, in talking with the Historic Preservation Committee, uh, it's also a, a, a little bit of an hour, because they all want to work together to try and accomplish something, and I feel that sometimes they, they feel a little hamstring by not being able to have those conversations. I think we all know how uh, difficult it is to want to talk and uh, have, to, have to stick to those. The only other thing I wanted to, to point out, so I, I guess I could go either way. I, I, I would be fine with, with having all five on there. I, in fact, I, I, I kind of personally prefer that just because that's what the committee wanted to do, but I do understand the, the reason for not doing that and for efficiency's sake. The only other thing was the consistency I think is really important. I think um, kind of allowing this once every three months uh, can be a little, uh, 
th that can allow for meetings to kind of pass by and to have them not be be assigned. And I would personally rather have there be a meeting that says uh, there is no uh, there is no matter to discuss or you know that's that sort of a thing. So that at least those meetings are are known when they'll be that they have to show up to it. I know serving on the Nevada League of Cities that was a concern that they wanted to move towards this and you know we all kind of agreed we'd rather not have anything to say and have the opportunity to get there when it needs that conversation uh, rather than perhaps needing it and because communication and setting it up and proper notice that can start to weigh down and it could maybe not intentionally be used to delay conversation but could lead to that uh, uh, inadequately so I would like to keep it just so that it I would like to keep a monthly required meeting even if they have to say no real topic of discussion and and it's as simple as that i know i would hate to put your staff at that just to show up to do nothing but i think it's important to, to have consistency in, the, in some of these meetings uh, council member adams just for clarification nobody would show up if there was no business before the committee we'd just post a vacate notice as a courtesy okay better council member bridges yeah i have a question about um quorum uh, if all five members of the Historic Preservation Committee are sitting in a room talking about matters of the Historic Preservation Committee, whether it's um, a specific issue that they're talking about or what creating policy, would that be a violation of the open meeting law because all five of them are deliberating outside of the committee on which they are on? If it was outside of a, a posted meeting and there was no agenda posted for their meeting and that was not open to the public it's definitely a violation yes okay but if they're i'm the way i'm trying to say okay they're all members of the historic preservation committee however there would not be a posted agenda for the historic preservation committee there would be a posted agenda of the ad hoc committee for historic preservation policy for example and all five of those members are on there, and they're talking about issues related to historic preservation. Are well, so as long as, as those members of the Historic Preservation Committee are also, by resolution of the council, are also members of the ad hoc committee, and it's within a properly uh, posted, noticed, and agendized meeting, then they can deliberate mm -hmm. all they want. Wonderful. Yeah. Within within the context of that meeting. Okay. okay thank you. Yes. Uh, you know, in in response to uh, the conversations, you know, again, I, I think the the problem is to look at what this ad hoc committee is supposed to accomplish. Um, you know, it, having all five members of the preservation committee there. Um, I, I don't know that that moves the process along. Um, they meet monthly anyway. Uh, they can certainly do it. I believe they even have a standing uh, agenda item uh, to discuss changes to the code. Uh, this is, I believe, something, a committee that should actually be looking to develop what that code is. And certainly the members of the committee should have input on that. But I don't think that it's necessary to have essentially a meeting that would just repeat a meeting that they've already had. So I, I think that if we're going to look at this as something that is to produce recommendations to city council, the preservation committee can meet. Uh, they can certainly inform the two members that would be on this committee of what they would like the committee to look at. Uh, you know, whether it be uh, examples of codes from other cities or states, uh, they can do that uh, just as well. But I, I've been to enough preservation committee meetings. Um, as I said, I was a member of the committee for some time. Uh, I think this committee is less discussion and more development, and having the time between meetings to do that development is more important than meeting each month because the preservation committee does that anyway. I just think that this uh, ad hoc committee is, is the purpose of it is to produce recommendations to council and having that 2-2 two -two split um, I think is probably the easiest thing to do. Any other questions or comments? 
Council Member Bridges? Yeah, one more question. Okay, would, would there be an advantage to having five in terms of a quorum, in terms of if there, I, I mean, I'm sure there's not going to be much that's going to be voted upon as opposed to presenting to Council, but in terms of a quorum, uh, four is sufficient to... It, it, beyond what uh, Madam City Clerk has already stated, uh, again, I, I'm not sure. Uh, you, you can look at uh, the ease of gathering those individuals for a meeting, as the mayor has said. Um, again, with a smaller group, you know, um, if, if some people are missing, then you don't have a, a quorum. So with more people, um, you know, that you could perhaps facilitate a quorum easier. So those are all considerations. Okay. And whether it's four or five, the, the quorum would still be three, so. Okay. Correct. Yeah. I, do, I do have one question, maybe it's in here. The ability for uh, the individual members to call a meeting, um, is, that, um, is that defined in here? No, not in the uh, current guidelines. I think that would be important then to ensure that the, you know, whether we want it that two members or one member can, uh, you know, Two members can call a, a meeting. Uh, however, I just want to be sure that that's included in there. Um, that's really my my only my only thing. My opinion would be that we should either have all members of the of the committee or just two, um, so that we don't have just a small quorum that then has to go. So I think, uh, given the discussion, I think maybe having a more uh, nimble committee uh, with two and two might be good. So that it's uh, the idea here is to present uh, and, and advise, not. Um, to come to de decisions uh, and that they can present those. Um, yeah, I, I don't see any problem with doing it that way. Uh, I know other committees will have a standing agenda item uh, to discuss the timing of their next meeting, but I, you know I think we could put it in here. Um, probably three duties. We could add one for. Any committee member may request a meeting be held or be scheduled. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Folda? Well, and adding on to that, they could add an agenda item as well. Any member onto that agenda? Yes, yeah, so in addition to uh, calling a meeting to be able to place an item on the agenda? Any other questions or comments? Should it perhaps be two people to call a, a meeting? Uh, that way it, uh, there's not the potential of just one individual, or, or do we think that, I mean, I, I wouldn't suspect that anybody would abuse that privilege, but uh, you know, I also know there can be issues with you know, open meeting law and trying to go to one person, no, I don't want to, and then trying to have that discussion with another. Well, don't forget, if you get tired of the one person calling meetings all the time, you just don't show up and there won't be a meeting. <laughs> True enough. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would just not want to complicate it too much. I understand. Anyone else? Any other questions or comments? Well, then I will attempt uh, to make a motion to approve Resolution 7167. And I don't know, I, I guess, uh, do we need to make the committee members as part of this motion? With respect to selection? Yes. No, that would have to occur at a subsequent meeting. All right. Um, then I will move for resolution of 7167 with the following changes. Uh, item number two will read members and term. The city council shall appoint four members to the committee as follows. A, the committee will include two members of the Historic Preservation Committee. B, would remain the same. C would read the committee's duties will conclude and the committee will be dissolved on December 31, 2020 or when recommendations to the city council have been accepted. 2020. 2021, Mayor, I think. Am I skipping a year there? <laughs> yes, please make that 2021. Uh, number three 
would read, duties, the committee shall hold regular meetings, but not less regularly than once every three months. B would read, a quorum of four members shall be present, excuse me, a quorum of three members shall be present for a four member committee and be necessary for the transaction of business. If a quorum is not present, those in attendance shall be named and they shall adjourn to a later time. Uh, adding a new section C, any member of the committee shall have the ability to request a meeting be scheduled and any member shall have the ability to request items be placed on the agenda and that would then make the original C letter D. Four would remain the same. Five, effective date, this resolution will become effective on October 13, 2020 and shall remain in effect until December 31, 2021 or until the City Council has determined the committee has completed its work. Anyone wishing to second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mays. Now move to item number 10, items pertaining to the municipal pool. Mr. Luttrell. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Keegan Luttrell, the Public Works Director. Uh, this item before you is looking for discussion and staff directive on hiring a consultant to do a thorough analysis of the existing aquatic facility center and also providing their professional uh, engineer's estimate on what it would cost to, sorry I'm fogging up, what it would cost to uh, repair that facility and bring it up to code and if it's even feasible to do so. Uh, just a little background for the public. Uh, back in February of this year, we had brought this recommendation from the Pool Ad Hoc Committee um, to do uh, the RFP process to hire consultants. We did go through that process per your uh, council's direction. Um, due to COVID, that was put on hold. So we're bringing it back before you um, as the most recent Ad Hoc Committee did provide that recommendation again. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? Councilmember Adams. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just uh, wanted to say, um, while I wasn't able to attend the, the last meeting, I, I did review it. Um, uh, I, I do want to say that I think that uh, a lot of the concern that residents had with um, the construction of a new facility was that they weren't confident in uh, the necessity for that uh, construction over uh, repair and maintenance of the existing facility. Um, so I think that uh, moving in this direction will help provide maybe a little bit more of that confidence, a little bit more of that information for the residents uh, so that they can better make that determination uh, for us moving forward so that we can uh, come to a decision here uh, as a community uh, as to you know what and how our, our uh, amenity should be administered. So I do think that this is uh, an appropriate measure to instill confidence in the process. Anyone else? I would just note also that you have it in the materials here that because of a cost savings that was realized by having staff, uh, city staff do work on the pool heater, uh, there's enough money within the budget uh, to be able to pay for this. And I believe you had estimated uh, when we spoke yesterday the cost might be somewhere between 15 to 35, was that it, or 20 to 35? When we did the RFP process, we had narrowed it down to the top two or three. We'd have to still bring them in for interviews. But I believe the low, uh, low end of that was 20 or 21,000 and all the way up to 35,000. So we'd have to renegotiate that because it's been a number of months, but I don't anticipate it changing too much. Okay, and you know, we've had various estimates on the cost of a new facility but somewhere between 20 and 40 million. I know that's an awfully wide span, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is this is an expensive project. 
And uh, although 20000 or 35000 is not an insignificant amount of money, when you look at the potential of the total cost of replacing the pool, uh, again, as Council Member Adams had said, this seems to be a, a good investment. And also to, you know, uh, we may very well find that the, the existing facility can be modified and we don't wind up spending $30 million. Correct. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Anyone wishing to make a motion then? Um, I guess since this is up into two, I guess uh, two motions. The first, I will uh, move to direct staff to move forward with uh, consultant selection to provide a professional opinion on repairing the existing aquatic facility. And can I include in that same motion and also to uh, approve resolution number uh, 7168? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Mr. Luttrell. Thank you. And you're here for the next item as yep. well, discussion and staff directive on the Arizona Street Feeder Project. Yes, as you can recall back in May when we were approving the budget for this fiscal year, uh, due to COVID, there was the direction to bring CIP projects forward before expending any funds. Uh, so before you were, were asking for authorization to proceed, proceed on advertising the Arizona Street Feeder Project, this would be, as I explained in the briefings, this would be phase two or possibly three. Phase one was already completed uh, here in front of City Hall along Arizona Street from Utah to Nevada Way and that was undergrounding the facilities and upgrading them. Phase two or three would be from Nevada Way over to substation one, which is at the public works shops. Um, this would be upgrading all the aging infrastructure. Again, it would be undergrounding the facilities. There would be an above grade structure right at the Nevada Way intersection, but it would be replacing the, the old pole there. And then it would also be tying our feeders together to, in the long run, eliminate substation one. Um, and I believe that's in fiscal year 24 to be able to eliminate substation one. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? Council Member Fulton? I, I just have one, and I'm not sure if you, you know this one or not, but um, we just, you know, as you know, had our rate study done, and they took into account several um, capital improvement projects that will be taken out of use of funds. Was this project part of that rate study? Are you aware I'm or not? I'm 99% sure it was in there because it was in the CIP. Um, this was from a few years ago, so the funding is in the CIP, and they the uh, rate consultant did get all that information, so it would be factored into there. Okay. And because we, because it's so weird in their phases, uh, we would assume that the entire thing would have been factored in, not yep. just phase two. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and the reason I was saying phase two or three, it depends on the bid we'd get back. Right now, we you'll see in the table, we have uh, just over 1.1 million available for this project. If we get um, good bids, we can complete everything to tie into the substation one. If the numbers come back higher than expected, then we would have to split it out into two phases. And that's the way the plans were set up when uh, staff designed it in-house. Any other questions or comments? Uh, you know, just to reiterate on why we're doing things this way, uh, we put a freeze on any new projects going forward. Not that they would never be done, um, but we needed, we didn't know what was going to happen. So we didn't know what impact the pandemic was going to have on our finances. This particular project is in the utility fund um, and as you mentioned, has been budgeted for some time, but just never completed. So I, I think we need to keep that in mind that, you know, where this project is, what is the necessity of it? And again, I think, as you mentioned, this has actually been planned for some time. And I know from our conversation yesterday, it fits into a larger plan where substation one would eventually be uh, decommissioned mm -hmm. uh, as part of a uh, upgrade of the entire system. Yep. 
So I certainly think that uh, a project like this should move forward. Any other questions or comments? Anyone wishing to make a motion? So, I, I will beg to make a motion uh, for item 10 uh, to combine. Oh, I'm sorry, item, uh, item 11. I apologize, direct uh, to give staff direction for an authorization to proceed with the advertisement of bidding for the Arizona Street Feeder project number 18-1057-ED. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Mr. Luttrell. Thank you. Brings us to item number 12, appointment to the Civil Service Commission. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. The city, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Civil Service Commission is comprised of three members. Brenda Pappas's term expires at the end of this month and she has expressed an interest in reappointment. Qualifications for this um, commission um, are that no two members can be of the same political party. The two current members of the commission are of the same political party and the volunteers that are willing to serve are not of that party. So you can't appoint anybody that had, had expressed an interest. So I'm requesting the council appoint one member to serve on the Civil Service Commission for a three year term. Thank you. We'll go ahead then and open nominations for the uh, committee assignment. Council Member Bridges. Yes, I'd like to nominate Brenda Pappas. Thank you. Any other nominations? All right, entertain a motion then to close nominations. Move to close the nominations. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, Ms. Pappas then is reappointed for another three year term. Thank you. That brings us now to item number 13, uh, matters pertaining to the performance of the city manager. Council member Folda. Thank you. Um, before we proceed with this item, um, just some housekeeping matters. Um, on the dais, um, the council was provided um, proof of service for notice of this agenda item, and um, it is available to the public if anyone needs so. Um, also, before we begin, I want to make a disclosure. Um, as many are aware, the city manager um, and city attorney has filed a lawsuit against the city and several council members. I am one of the council members named in that suit. So while this is not a matter that constitutes a conflict of interest or that requires me to make a disclosure, I will do so anyway. Furthermore, I would like to state for the record that this in no way affects my judgment or ability to fairly and impartially participate in any discussion or action related to this agenda items 13 through 16. Thank you. And I would also like to make the same disclosure that a suit has been filed against the city of Boulder City. Uh, I have also been named individually as uh, in the lawsuit. I do not believe that will affect my judgment in this matter. I also have uh, no pecuniary interest or financial interest in that uh, and will therefore be participating in the discussion and possible vote. Council Member Bridges. Okay, I, I wanted to disclose that as part of the original lawsuit with the uh, TRO and the injunction that I had a, an, an interest in a, an issue that was brought up in that lawsuit and that I don't believe that it colors or affects my decision making tonight but I did feel it was necessary to disclose that. Any other disclosures anyone wishes to make? All right, Councilmember Folda. 
Okay, um, so item number 13 are matters, per perform ugh, sorry, matters pertaining to the performance of the city manager, Alfonso Noyola. Um, can we just make sure that um, our city manager, Alfonso Noyola, is still on the phone before we proceed? Mr. City Manager, are you able to hear this? Um, Mayor, if I disclose at the beginning of the meeting, I'm not participating in items 13 through 16. Thank you. Well, I understand, but you are able to hear this. I'll take your reaction as a yes that you can hear. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, um, item number A is to discuss the alleged misconduct and professional competence of the city manager um, and his performance as a city manager. Um, Item number B, the um, this is the discussion of the city manager, Noyola, use, alleging to use his position to deter a council member from placing items on the agenda. Um, and then obtaining review by outside council of employment contracts for him as a city manager and for the city attorney, Stephen Morris. Um, after that action had failed to be approved by a majority of a council at a previous meeting. Item number C uh, is discussion of allegations to have been taken by the city manager under the emergency powers that existed during a public health crisis for a matter at the municipal airport regarding the fuel delivery and transport and storage. Um, so I also just want to say, I know that there was some concern from the community that we were talking about um, any sort of mental health. Um, those are words that came straight out of NRS and that's not what we're here for tonight. Um, what I put these on here was to discuss um, the professional competence of the city manager and his work duties. Um, and under item number B, I feel that um, the city manager Noyola used his position to deter a council member from placing an agenda item on the agenda um, in regards to his contract. Um, then without and adverse to a previous council vote, procured outside council to review his contracts for himself and other appointed officials. Um, item number C, as council is aware, the city, city manager approved the BC airport fuel dispensing, handling and storage standards under an emergency de declaration pursuant to response to a global pandemic. Um, um, these, for these reasons, I find that this was um, and I feel the council, because they didn't approve that item, um, decided that was not a use of the declaration. Um, these items that I put on there, I felt that they were items that the city council as a whole was aware of. Um, while I have other issues that I take with the city manager, I'm not gonna go into great detail this evening, um, but I just want to say that, um, you know, it's taken some time to be here tonight. Um, this is something that I felt that the council should have the opportunity to discuss. Um, I felt that um, we had a city manager that was working adverse to the council and um, I have lost confidence or trust in his position as city manager. Thank you. Other questions or comments from council? Council Member Bridges. Yes, thank you. Um, I have several. So, uh, and this is just having to do with item number 13. Um, first of all, I, I understand, and I'm not sure if there's been any other deliberations with uh, the outside legal firm that was uh, brought into this issue. I have been left out, uh, I have not been involved in any deliberation with outside counsel. Uh, I was under the impression it only had to do with the temporary restraining order and injunction uh, issue. Uh, and uh, any other discussions, I have not been part and party to that. Um, and, I, and I've always wanted to say that I never received an, an invitation to participate in a teleconference at the beginning of all of this. Um, I was contacted through a cellular number associated with my iPad, which just works for receiving internet. 
Um, okay, definitely. I would like to uh, say about Mr. Nyola that he's been professional, responsive to my requests, and always I've, I've received requested information. I have no, nothing to criticize in that part. Um, I do want to say uh, I was the one who requested an agenda item that would pass the mustard with respect to the open meeting law in terms of the contract review and its consistency with the city charter. I was called the night after the council meeting last fall by a previous supporter and I was told to fix it, that I was supposed to have voted for the agenda item, what was, going, what was I going to do about it? I wrote a new agenda item and submitted it for appropriateness with Lou and Al to start and then the city attorney. The city manager said that I did not need an agenda item, that all I had to do was ask and our labor attorney would review the contracts. Councilwoman Fulda was perfectly aware as to the purpose and source of this request since we were all in Texas at the time of the League of Cities conference. She knew the whole situation, was just concerned whether or not the labor attorney would be unbiased. I felt assured that this would be the right way to do it and asked to have it done. It was an administrative request and was not in conflict with the previous agenda item, which in its title did not specify what the contracts might include that was problematic and it was not about an attorney chosen by the city council. Again, it was an administrative request solicited by a council member. Uh, number three, during the pandemic, there were a number of issues that needed to have emergency consideration in as much as there was emergency concern from the fire chief and the airport manager, there seemed to be enough concern that something should be taken care of so that other emergencies could be addressed if something were to happen at the airport Four, I do not support the termination of the city manager, especially in this context. I feel that it was contrived effort to make sure he would be terminated without the benefit of a negotiated severance package. An earlier agreement to terminate with benefits that he deserves would have been the appropriate way to handle it, considering it was implied promise made early in the election. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Councilmember Hoskins. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, 13A, my experience has caused me to question the professionalism of the city manager. B, I find the actions of the city manager and the city attorney to be unacceptable. C, I have concerns with the city manager using the emergency powers in a situation at the airport that I find to be excessive. I would like to have him terminated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Mayor. Um, since joining the City Council a year and a half ago, um, I have worked hard to show deference and respect to the um, professional opinion and guidance of our city manager and his office. Um, while there are certainly areas at which Mr. Noyola has shown his competence, um, his attitude towards this council um, has often been reluctant, uh, antagonistic, and uh, even oppositional at times. Um, his approach has interfered, I believe, with the city council's ability to govern effectively and efficiently. Um, and unfortunately, his attitude and I think his actions um, have caused the relationship of the city council uh, to deteriorate uh, beyond a point of repair. And therefore, um, I do not believe he is able to serve as city manager. Um, I'm not pleased or happy to have to arrive at this conclusion. Um, but I must act in the best interest of this city, and for that reason, um, I will be voting in favor of terminating Mr. Noyola's contract. Thank you. Um, you know, th this is always a difficult situation, and it's, it is made awkward, uh, more awkward by the requirements that are in state law to have a public meeting to do this. Councilmember Fulda has already referred to the fact that some of the language that is required by the law to be included uh, may give the impression that there are other allegations that are being made against an individual that are just not present. Uh, and, and I think, again, Council Member Fold had already mentioned those with regard to uh, physical or mental uh, issues. Uh, that, that's not what is here in the packet. Um, I also think that we need to keep in mind that this is not a performance review of the city manager. 
that language also is, is part of what is included. But what this is, is an evaluation of the whether we want an individual to uh, continue on as a city manager. Uh, the city charter for Boulder City makes it clear that three or more members of the city council may appoint or remove the city manager as an appointed official. Uh, that provision is only restricted by the requirement to provide the notification that I mentioned earlier to that appointed official and have a public meeting, which we are doing so now. Uh, it has taken considerable effort uh, to have this issue finally heard at a meeting. Uh, th this is a situation that has gone on for weeks. Uh, it has certainly been one that has required additional time, effort, and expense for the taxpayers to bring about. Uh, as I mentioned, the city manager um, is an appointed official. In my view, the city manager has failed to provide a level of professional competence that is needed to provide this city with the management actions needed to benefit the community. Mr. Noyola has failed to consult and inform the council on significant issues, as indicated in the information council member folder included in the agenda packet. I do not have confidence in Mr. Noyola to serve this city well or be responsive to this city council. His actions are described in the agenda materials and fail to provide the level of professional competence needed. His actions have gone beyond failures or of professional competence, and there is cause to terminate the employment contract of the city manager. I believe the city, the termination of the employment contract with Mr. Noyola is in the best interest of the city. Any other questions or comments? Councilmember Fulda. Thank you. I just want to uh, correct a fact that um, was mentioned by Councilmember Bridges um, about placing an item on the, um, the agenda that she had requested. Um, while we were at the Nevada League of Cities, um, Councilmember Bridges did uh, tell me that she was planning on putting an agenda item up on the for reviewing the uh, uh, contracts for the appointed officials. Um, that was in a different language. Um, due to the concerns of a previous um, wordage of an agenda item. However, um, it was not at that time, but until later the next month in December when the agenda item was placed, um, when I noticed that the agenda item was not on the agenda, that I asked Councilmember Bridges why it wasn't there, and that's when she let me know that she, um, the city manager had told her she did not need to require to put it on. Just wanted to correct that fact. Thank you. Is there a representative here for Mr. Noyola that wishes to make any statements or comments? Mr. Noyola, do you wish to make any statements or comments? Okay, by that silence, I will assume that he does not wish to do so. Uh, I've not seen any indication of a representative here for him. Is there anyone wishing to make a motion on this matter? Mayor, I will, um, excuse me. I will move to um, approve resolution 7169, amending the resolution to read. Under now, therefore, let resolve that the city council terminates the employment contract um, agreement number pursuant to section, I want to add under the agreement number and the charter no, uh, agreement number that um, to add the wording pursuant to section 11, subsection A for a cause, and then continue resulting in the separation of El Noyola from employment from the city of Boulder City. 
Anyone wishing to second that? I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. The motion passes four to one with council member Bridges dissenting. Uh, the resolution 7169 as amended is approved and the contract for employment between the city of Boulder City and Alfonso Noyle is terminated. Okay, we will move then to item number 14, uh, resolution 7170. And I would just like to explain on this item that we are able to discuss uh, the process for appointing an interim person for this. Uh, the, the agenda item, I believe, is, is clear on that regard. Uh, so we can discuss the process for it. Uh, if anyone has names that they would like to have uh, uh, considered, we can discuss uh, those individuals. Uh, but we will, my recommendation will be that we schedule a special meeting for next Wednesday. That would be uh, October 21 at 1 p.m. in the afternoon uh, to make any appointments so that the proper notifications can be provided. Any questions about uh, the purpose of this item then or the discussion? All right, we'll go ahead and open it up. Uh, Council Member Folda, is there anything you wish to add to that? Um, no, so this agenda item was to be considered if the majority of the council um, were to terminate the employment contract of the city manager um, because of concerns that um, we do not have someone named, um, we will, um, I'm, you know, I'm okay with bringing that back to another time. Um, however, due to um, this position, I would feel that it would be appropriate to uh, uh, appoint an acting city manager that is familiar with the city and who's currently um, in the department head with city um, Boulder City. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Adams. Thank you. I, uh, I agree with Member Folded. I believe that would be ideal. So I, I hope that there would be a, a person that is familiar with um, the functions of Boulder City um, and its day-to-day -day operations who could uh, hopefully fulfill that role. Thank you. Anyone else? I would just like to add to that, um, you know, looking back on the past history of the appointment of interim officials, uh, the pay uh, has pretty much stayed the same, uh, was accepted for whatever the existing position was, and that may change then at uh, a time when a permanent person or permanent replacement is made. Uh, so that's something I think we should keep in mind. Uh, obviously, we will need the assistance of uh, human resources in getting a contract together for something like this. Uh, so I would just, you know, put uh, Mr. Bolt on notice that uh, that may be an outcome uh, that will occur at the next meeting. Uh, you know, there are individuals here in the city who have served in an acting capacity as a city manager in the past. Uh, I, the requirement is that any names to be considered need to be included in the agenda. And if we are going to have that meeting uh, next Wednesday, uh, tomorrow would probably be the latest. Madam City Clerk, is that the latest that uh, you would be able to get the packet materials together? The uh, the main thing is the agenda. The packet materials really don't have a time frame. It just has to be provided to the public at the same time it is provided to the council. The agenda has to be posted no later than 9 o'clock on Thursday, 9 a.m. Thursday morning. Okay. I, I believe the law is actually 36 hours, but because of the work schedule... R right. I mean, we can. I guess we can technically count... Friday, or excuse me, 72 hours. It's three, three working days. You can't count the date of the meeting, so we would count Thursday 
I can't, I mean, I guess I could post it Friday morning, but those aren't our normal business hours, but it would have to be posted by Thursday at nine. Okay. Friday, we could count Friday technically, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so again, what I would suggest then is if there are individuals that you would like to consider, uh, notify the city clerk of those names so that they can be included in the agenda item. Any other questions or comments? Okay, um, what I would do then is make a motion then to hold in abeyance uh, resolution 7170 until that special meeting is held on October 21. Anyone wishing to second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, we will now move to item number 15, uh, matters pertaining to the performance of the city attorney. And again, Council Member Folda. Thank you. Um, again, for this item, the proof of service was provided to the city council on the dais and is available for the public if they so choose. Um, this is matters to pertain to the performance of the city attorney um, and discussion not uh, in as his performance as a city manager or sorry city attorney. Um, item under under item number A is discussion to consider consider um, his professional service as city attorney. Item number B is discussion of actions alleged to have been taken by the city attorney and providing misleading information to one of our members of the city council with respect of the right of a majority of the council to retain a special counsel. I think um, council is all very much aware of this meeting that took place October of 2019 um, when, that took, when that happened. Um, item number C is the discussion of allegations to have been taken by City Attorney Morris and providing misleading information to one or more members of the City Council pertaining to the application of provisions of NRS 241 to Morris as a public official. And um, if you're not familiar with NRS 240, sorry, 281, um, that is ethics um, under NRS for public officials. Um, so under this item, you know, obviously this isn't something um, comfortable for me or probably anyone here. Um, but um, in the last year or so that I've been on council, um, I have found, um, as I observe and have worked on this council, um, that I have a great concern for um, the legal protection of the city. Um, that there have been um, conflicts in the um, legal advice that this council has received and um, I believe some of them were misleading and possibly self-benefiting benefit, um, advice. Um, I felt that there was a failure to keep council apprised of threatened pending and open legal torts against the city. Um, and. Um, I, um, through these actions of the city attorney, I have lost confidence and trust in him as the city attorney. I brought this forward for the council for discussion. Thank you, and I, I believe uh, if there is anyone who wishes to make a disclosure, uh, we probably need to do that uh, as we did for the prior item, or excuse me, the two items prior. Anyone wishing to make disclosures regarding this item? Council Member Folda. Uh, Mayor, once again, I'll state for the record that I want to make a disclosure. As many are aware that the city attorney is part of an action lawsuit against the city and me as a council member, I uh, am named in that one of those suits. So while this is not a matter that constitutes a conflict of interest or requires me to make a disclosure, I do so anyway. Furthermore, I would like to state for the record that this in no way affects my judgment or ability to fairly and impartially participate in any discussion or action related to item number 15. 
Thank you. And I will make a similar disclosure that uh, I also have been named in a lawsuit filed by the city attorney against the city of Boulder City. Uh, I've been named individually. I also do not feel that uh, that action is going to significantly present a conflict for me to be able to uh, participate in discussions and possible actions regarding this matter. Councilmember Bridges. And I would like to make a disclosure that I had a conflict of interest in the issue of uh, the temporary restraining order and injunction lawsuit. And uh, that I that this in no way affects or colors my ability to make a decision on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Fold, is there anything else that you would wish to uh, offer by way of presentation on this item? Um, well, there are other um, items that I feel um, that um, our city attorney has failed to um, protect the city and the council and staff. Um, I do not wish to discuss any other items at the time. If there's anyone that needs elaboration on the items I put on, though, I can discuss that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Bridges? Yes, sir, thank you. Um, I do have a couple of comments that I've written. Um, the, the first one, I, I would like to give the brief form, which is I can only say that in the year I've been on council, a year and a half, that I felt that he has always been professional and an advocate for what is best for the city. Two, I do not now, and this is item B, uh, nor did I ever believe that Mr. Morris was attempting to do anything but protect the council from facing a, an OML violation. I do believe that he wanted to keep this off the agenda, but not that he wanted to keep it off the agenda, but rather wanted to clarify the wording of these items in order to make sure that they had the necessary substance. At the time, I really thought it might be questionable agenda item, yet I felt there was an underlying motive that should have been honestly proposed along with the items. I had studied the open meeting law regulations and the charter and did not believe there was a conflict and that it wasn't necessary. Um, and I'm under number three, I really do not understand um, the, what's entitled entailed in number three in terms of the violation of the NRS 281, the disagreement between whether it covered him or not. And number four, I do not support this agenda item. And just like with Mr. Nyola, this issue might have been handled above board with the severance of the city attorney with the benefits he was accorded rather than building a case that was inevitable that would keep him from supporting himself or looking for another job. That's Are you it. finished? Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Anyone else? Council Member Hoskins? Yes, sir, thank you. Um, a, from my experience, the professional competence of the city attorney is concerning. B, I received the packet documentation for this meeting, and I believe the documents, documentation to be accurate. The city attorney has provided misleading information to myself and to other council members. C, the city attorney provided me with misleading information concerning NRS 281. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, like uh, with the city manager in his office, um, I have deferred to the legal advice that has been provided by our city attorney um, and shown respect and deference uh, to his professional opinions, uh, even when his opinions have run counter to my own. Um, I have done so because I believe that that is what is owed uh, to the office of our legal counsel. Um, but when the city attorney's legal opinions fail to uh, withstand review uh, by the attorney general's office on basic principles of Nevada's open meeting law, um, his credibility is diminished. Um, he has provided this council, I believe, with inconsistent or incomplete um, opinions, which have led to confusion. Uh, and hindered this council's productivity and our overall effectiveness. Uh, I am not a legal mind, uh, and therefore uh, I must be able to rely upon the uh, legal advice provided by the city attorney. And 
unfortunately, I cannot say with any confidence uh, that I find myself in such a position at this time. And therefore, uh, in accordance with what is best for the city, I, I do believe that uh, we should terminate Mr. Morris's contract. Thank you. Uh, similar to what I had commented on with regard to the two, uh, item, two items prior, um, these public meetings are required by state law. Uh, they are required when uh, there's any action that may be contemplated with regard to an appointed official. The wording, again, uh, that's required in those letters, uh, things such as physical or mental health, uh, that's not part of what I see in any of the uh, agenda materials here. But what is in there is the character, alleged misconduct, and professional competence of the city attorney. The terms that apply to actions of the city attorney to be considered in determining uh, whether to continue or terminate the existing contract, uh, that, that also is not necessarily part of this discussion at this time. Uh, I think that my experience, as many of the items in the agenda packet show, have taken away any confidence I have whatsoever in the city attorney's ability to provide legal advice either to myself or this council as a whole. The city charter makes it clear that three or more members of the city council may appoint or remove the city attorney as an appointed official. That provision is only restricted by that requirement to give notice and hold a public hearing or a public meeting as, as such as we are doing now. Uh, once again, we've had considerable effort in getting to this point uh, because of certain actions that were taken. Uh, you know, we, we initially had scheduled, I had requested a special meeting back at the beginning of August for this. Um, through various actions, that period of time was elongated considerably. The position of the city attorney requires a high level of confidence that the legal advice that's going to be provided is accurate, complete, and unbiased. The city attorney has made, directly made, statements to me that were clearly not in accordance with state law regarding conflicts he had in matters. That type of advice is simply not acceptable. The position of the city attorney requires a high level of confidence. Mr. Morris has made statements to me regarding wording in the city charter that obviously was not the meaning of the wording that was being discussed. The advice was not only incorrect, but concerned issues directly related to his position as city attorney. Again, that is not acceptable. It is spelled out in NRS 281 that when you do have a conflict, you are supposed to either recuse yourself or make the person aware specifically of what that conflict is. I think that goes to a very high level when we're talking about an attorney and the advice that they're going to provide. I believe the city attorney has repeatedly failed to meet his obligations and that the interests of the city require sound legal advice in order to function properly, and I will be voting to terminate the contract. Any other questions or comments? Councilmember Folda, do you wish to make a motion on the resolution? I do. Are you going to provide an opportunity? Certainly. Thank you. Now, again, I, you know, the reason I did not refer to you earlier, Mr. Morris, is because we seem to have uh, this confusion about what recusal means. The city manager uh, had chosen not to respond, not to have a representative here. So apparently there's a difference of understanding about that. But certainly you have the opportunity to make a statement or to have a representative make a statement on your behalf? Well, you, you uh, certainly didn't confuse that with Mr. Noyola, but um, race to confuse it with me. But I appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council, 
Um, to, to begin with, I, I, I do beg to differ with uh, Mr. Jaime Cruz of Workforce Connections that this wasn't uh, was an inappropriate meeting. It may be the perfect meeting for uh, Mr. Cruz to be here. And Judy, maybe you can give me his card uh, before we leave today. Um, is, um, as you have been advised by staff, legal counsel, and by comments from the public, this council proceeds today with a sham hearing and candidly a circus. And Mr. Mayor and Councilwoman Folda, you're the ringmasters of this circus. And it's all under the guise of NRS 241.033. Um, this council has chosen to proceed despite multiple and fatal procedural and substantive defects under Nevada's open meeting law and in direct violation of my due process and contractual rights. Because of these violations, which I will highlight momentarily, any action taken by the city council today is void as a matter of law under NRS 241.036. And I formally reserve all of my rights under NRS 241 to put on witnesses and introduce written evidence if and when a 241 hearing is ever properly brought before this body. When I was originally hired as city attorney, it was with overwhelming support of the department heads and city staff with whom I had worked closely during my tenure as the acting city attorney. And I believe the same support is still present today among the city personnel with whom I work most closely. So why are we here? Contrary to the written agenda, we are not here to deliberate about whether agenda items 15 B and C constitute good cause for my termination. These are mere pretexts. We are here for one purpose only, to complete the unlawful, retaliatory, and discriminatory objective of certain members of this council. According to the agenda, the conduct in question for which I am being evaluated today occurred in October of 2019, almost one full year ago. But the mayor and city council took no action to terminate my employment for that conduct. Indeed, today is the first day that I'm hearing some of these allegations. Now, what kind of leadership is that? What kind of management is that? On July 22nd, 2020, I was interviewed in a protected investigation into the conduct of city leadership for harassment, bullying, religious discrimination, and the creation of a hostile work environment. I participated in this investigation and reported my own and witnessed examples of such harassing, hostile, and discriminatory conduct from certain members of council. Within 24 hours of that protected interview and my report of harassment and discrimination, and nine months after the purported conduct addressed in items 15 B and C, I received the first notice from Councilwoman Folda for an August 6th special meeting to address my conduct, character, and possible termination. The timing is no coincidence, and such unlawful conduct is blatantly retaliatory. As the city is well aware, this unlawful conduct is being litigated before the District Court and the Nevada Equal Rights Commission. Nevertheless, despite the pendency of these actions into the lawfulness of the city's conduct, the council appears ready to proceed and indeed has. Today, if the council chooses to proceed with termination as it already has with Mr. Noyola, it does so with full knowledge of the following fatal facts. First, as to notice, the council has never complied with the prerequisite elements of NRS 241.0331A because the public body never authorized notice of this hearing that the council now attempts to hold. It is the public body that must authorize notice and the public body can only act through a majority vote of this council. You should all know that. You were trained in that. That never occurred. The public body does not and cannot act through the letter of an individual council member, in this case, Councilwoman Folda, or the concerted actions of a council member and the mayor. This defect in notice is fatal 
to the validity of this meeting and in direct violation of Nevada open meeting laws. It was precisely for this defect that the 8th Judicial District Court issued a temporary restraining order to enjoin the conduct of this council and shut down the August 6th special meeting for violation of the open meeting law. The city in proceeding with this meeting now makes the same fatal mistake again. So this talk of it's taken us long to get here is only due to the ongoing violations of the open meeting law by this council. Second, as to service, even if notice of this hearing was proper, which it was not, Proceeding with this hearing now is another direct violation of the Nevada Open Meeting Law because of defective service. Service can be accomplished two ways under the statute. Personal service, at least five working days before the meeting, or service by certified mail, at least 21 working days before the meeting. You can find that in NRS 241.033. Neither method of service was effectuated in this case. So let's talk about personal service. This council tried to proceed with this meeting on September 22nd, 2020, based on personal service on the wrong person at the wrong residence, purporting to have constituted personal service on me. Now, how does that look? Wouldn't surprise me if it was a member of the Boulder City Community Alliance that posed as Stephen Morris and accepted service. This erroneous proof of service was retracted by the process server himself, causing this council for the second time to vacate this hearing because it would have violated the open meeting law for failure to properly serve the affected party. Today, the council chooses to proceed again despite knowledge of defective service, this time by certified mail. The open meeting law is clear that service of any purported notice must not count the day of the meeting itself or the day of the mailing if not delivered to the postal service before 9 a.m. Yet that is precisely what the city has done here. Moreover, in, a, in an attempt to hide this defect, the city failed to provide proof of service to the public in violation of Boulder City's own rules. This is not proof of service. There is no acknowledgement, there is no attestation from an individual who purportedly served this. All someone has to do is look at the open meeting law manual and it'll provide you a form for proof of service. Doesn't look like this. It is mandatory requirement of Nevada's open meeting law that for this meeting to go forward, proof of service of the notice must have been received. And there is no proof of service contained in this support documentation. This certainly isn't it. And that's for good reason. The city's purported proof of service, again, just pr provided today, highlights its own defect. For service to be valid, the city tries to count the actual day of mailing as one of the 21 days, despite the fact that mailing took place at 5.24 p.m. You'll notice that on this document. After the close of the working day, this is a clear violation of Nevada's open meeting law. Bailey Kennedy, the council's own attorneys, admitted that you can't count the day in which the meeting occurs. The very opinion that they cite to also says that you can't serve and count the day of service if it happens after 9 a.m. Apparently, Bailey Kennedy can count to 100,000, but they can't count to 21. Even under certified mailing, the city's service is defective. And the open meeting law is very clear. This meeting cannot go forward under such circumstances. This fact alone renders any act taken at this meeting on these agenda items void 
as a matter of law. Finally, if the city votes to authorize termination, it does so in direct violation of my contractual rights. Section 11 of my employment, uh, employment agreement prohibits termination within six months before or six months after a city council election. As the city is very well aware, we are squarely within that safe harbor period today. But notwithstanding this safe harbor and in a poorly disguised effort to unlawfully circumvent my contractual severance rights and furtherance of retaliatory goals, the city has trumped up for cause for cause reasons for termination highlighted in agenda items 15 B and C. Such justifications are meritless and pretextual. And such action and termination if taken today will be in direct breach of my employment agreement and my contractual and due process rights. Moreover, such, such actions will only serve as a cover for the city's impermissible discriminatory and retaliatory conduct towards its employees and staff. In City Hall, fear and retaliation have become a method of governance. The citizens and the residents of Boulder City deserve much better. As to agenda item 15B, my legal advice to the city council was for greater specificity in the agenda item description. In that instance, my advice would have afforded greater transparency, greater specificity, and greater protection to the city under the open meeting law, not less. And if followed, it would, it, which it undisputedly was not followed, it would have likely avoided the resulting open meeting law complaint in its entirety. Agenda item 15C. Regarding agenda item 15C and a potential conflict of interest, as this council is aware, the city, and when I say the city, Mayor McManus and Councilwoman Folda filed a retaliatory complaint with the Ethics Commission on this very issue. Notably, that complaint is still pending without decision from the Ethics Commission. To terminate on this basis while this very issue remains pending before the appropriate adjudicative body is pretextual at best and cannot serve as a viable basis of for cause for termination. Again, Mr. Mayor and members of council, I reserve all rights to present witnesses and written evidence in rebuttal to these two accusations if and when a 241 hearing is ever properly brought before this body. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Do you have uh, any other representatives here that would uh, be speaking on your behalf or? I've made my statement. Them? I've made my statement, Mr. Mayor, and I have completed that. Thank you. Anyone wishing to uh, make questions or comments following uh, Mr. Morris's statement? Councilmember Folda. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, sorry. Sorry, I'm having bad. <laughs> Help me, Holly. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I think for the input from the city attorney, um, I just want to state for the record that I do believe that I complied with the requirements for posting and um, mailing of the service for this agenda item. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Councilmember Foldo, would you like to make a motion on this? Mayor, I move to um, approve resolution 7160, terminating the employment agreement number 18 1765 between the city of Boulder City and Stephen Morris. But I'd like to amend the amendment uh, resolution under now, therefore, let it be resolved 
that the City Council terminates the employment contract agreement, number 18-1765. Um, and after the following one, add pursuant to section 11, subsection A for cause, resulting in the separation of Stephen Morris from employment for the City of Boulder City. Thank you. Any discussion? Do we have a second for the motion? A second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Uh, resolution 7160 is approved by a vote of four to one with Council Member Bridges dissenting. The contract for employment between the City of Boulder City and Stephen Morris is terminated at this time. We'll take a 10-minute uh, recess at this time and uh, resume at 10.20. Uh, Thank you. recess we'll uh, come back to order here and we'll move to uh, item number 16 resolution 7160 appointment of an acting city attorney again council member Folda is there anything you wish to present on this item um, thank you mayor this item also would have been would be considered if the majority of council voted to um, remove the city attorney. Um, as there is not a named replacement at this time, um, I would like to maybe discuss, but not a point at this time. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Hoskins? So I want to make sure we have the right resolution number. Uh, I have it as 7161. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Adams. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, um, uh, with regards to this, I was approached by, by one member. Um, at this time, I'm not sure whether um, we should be mentioning names or not, considering the thing, but I, I was approached by at least one uh, uh, attorney here uh, within uh, the state of Nevada who I think um, uh, her her knowledge of um, Nevada's open meeting laws of of um, in fact even just the unique uh, status of Boulder City in comparison with uh, some of the other neighboring municipalities she was um, very familiar with and so I was impressed and I think uh, definitely somebody that could at least be considered um, at that meeting. Um, you know you're free to mention names if you would like to. The, the person was um, I just want to make sure I get it right uh, Brittany Walker um, so. Uh, she came at also at a good um, recommendation from others whose opinion I trust. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Walker is, is here this evening. If you would like to come up and make any remarks. Thank you so <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergies have been bad. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mayor and City Council members. Um, I am Brittany Lee Ship Walker, and I um, am honored to receive a recommendation to serve as the acting city attorney for Boulder City. I'm a lifelong resident of Southern Nevada, and I, I've always loved Boulder City. In fact, my husband and I were married here at Grace Community Church by Pastor David Graham, and uh, we had our reception at the Boulder Dam Hotel. Um, I hold two degrees from Nevada Higher Educational Institutions. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from UNLV and a Juris Doctor from William S. Boyd School of Law. I'm admitted to practice law in Nevada as well as Arizona. Prior to law school, I served as nonpartisan staff in the Nevada Assembly. In fact, um, uh, Ms. Bustamante Adams that was here with Workforce Connections, I first met her when she was Assemblywoman Bustamante Adams at the state legislature. So it was nice to walk in and see a familiar face. Um, uh, during, um, upon conclusion of my role at the Nevada Assembly, 
I then studied for the LSAT and um, applied to law school here at Boyd. Uh, during law school, I clerked at the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada for nearly a year. Um, I learned a lot about how government functions in that role. We had a lot of open meeting on public records issues that I worked on as well as some transactional drafting as a law clerk. Uh, I then worked for, as a legislative extern for Holland and Hart, primarily representing RTC during the 2017 legislative session. Um, upon graduating magna cum laude from law school, I clerked for Judge, now Justice Abby Silver at the Nevada Court of Appeals. And upon conclusion of my judicial clerkship, I was hired as an associate at Holland and Hart, uh, where I served as associate counsel for several public entities, including RTC. As you may know, Mayor McManus as a board member and um, you know, as Boulder City is a constituent entity, um, Holland and Hart is general counsel, outside general counsel for RTC. So we worked on a lot of various issues affecting them, including again, open meeting law, ethical rules, NRS 281, um, <clears throat> as well as transactional drafting. I also uh, worked on some of the litigation matters with uh, a council, council that was appointed um, by Coolpack. So I have some experience with that as well. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, in that role, I also represented RTC in government affairs again at the 2019 legislative session. Uh, that was where I really became familiar with the laws affecting local government because we tracked bills that related to everything from collective bargaining, uh, public ethics, open meeting law, um, public works, uh, all of those things. And so I'm very familiar with those statutory schemes as a result of that role. Um, as an associate at Holland and Hart, I also served as counsel to a couple of general improvement districts, including a power general improvement district uh, here in the state. As well, and um, I represented Sun Valley General Improvement District at the state legislature. Um, while they're a GID and not a municipality, they function much like a municipality in that they provide water and sewer and recreational services to their residents. So, and through my legislative, I, want, I wanted to mention um, Holland and Hart, I just want to disclose that Holland and Hart does represent Consolidated Edison, um, which is a lessee, a solar lessee um, of Boulder City property. I never did any legal work for Consolidated Edison while at Holland and Hart. I did represent Consolidated Edison at the state legislature, uh, but primarily worked on bill tracking for them. I didn't represent them before any legislators or in any committee meetings. Through my legislative and legal experience, I am well acquainted, acquainted with Nevada's statutory schemes affecting local government. Um, I possess a unique understanding of how these laws work together in practice, and I believe I will be able to assist the city in interpreting how this legislation will affect these issues that the city is facing and addressing any legal issues as they arise before the city. Um, I want to also mention that when I served on law review in law school, I wrote my student note on the United States Supreme Court opinion of Reed versus Town of Gilbert. And specifically, that opinion dealt with um, a local sign ordinance that was shut down, uh, struck down for First Amendment violations. So I became very familiar with First Amendment law and how it affects local government and local governing. Um, I also assisted the Court of Appeals judges in researching and drafting the Nevada Appellate Court opinion, uh, Glover Armont versus Cargyle, which dealt with sovereign immunity and the discretionary act exception. So I'm familiar with that as well through that experience. In preparation for the possibility of receiving this appointment, I have closely read and reviewed the Boulder City Charter, NRS Chapter 268, governing municipal, power, municipal powers and other relevant authorities. I believe I'm fully prepared to serve as your acting city attorney, and should the council vote to appoint me at the next meeting, um, I would faithfully execute the powers afforded to me by the Boulder City Charter and Nevada state law, including professional representation of the, of the city of Boulder City on all legal matters, both civil and criminal, and offering timely, accurate, complete, and unbiased advice to all city council members uh, and the mayor. Uh, as well as the city manager and department heads as needed. Uh, I want to say that through my experience, I have a deep understanding of the function of government and a deep understanding of the role of an attorney. And I will, if appointed acting city attorney, I will always act as an advocate for the city.
Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And again, I know I've had an opportunity to uh, speak with Ms. Walker in the several times in the past. Uh, a a well-rounded background that encompasses uh, most of the aspects of what city government is about. Uh, we are not just about entering into litigation, but uh, there are legislative tasks, there are uh, state statutes to abide by, there are all those types of things. So uh, thank you. Any, any other uh, comments or? Again, thank you, Ms. Walker. Any other statements, uh, questions, comments? All right, um, I will move to whole, well, uh, again, to, to go back to uh, what had occurred regarding appointment of the city, uh, an interim city manager. Um, you know, we are able to discuss the process. Uh, we will, I will be requesting a special meeting for Wednesday, October 21st, where this appointment may be considered at. Uh, again, if there are other names that people wish to have be considered, they should be submitted uh, before end of day tomorrow to ensure that they are listed in the agenda. Any other questions or comments regarding that? I guess one other item, I, uh, based on past practice, when an interim has been appointed, it has most often been at the same level of pay as the existing, and that may change when an, a permanent uh, replacement is named. And again, we would look to human resources to help with preparing uh, a contract for whoever is named for the position. So, Mayor, just to clarify, the items that are coming back next week would be for a contract for a acting city manager and city attorney, as well as um, the appointment. Um, potentially, uh, you know, again, I, I can't predict what's going to happen next week. But for consideration, yes, I, I think those would be the agenda items. So, if, so I guess my question is, four, one, uh, four resolutions, one appointing and acting, and then a subsequent resolution of approving a temporary contract or a contract, and then the same for the um, other position. That's correct. And I will, I, you know, I will send you a formal request for the special meeting tomorrow and uh, also the agenda items that would be included at the meeting. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Folda? Um, so are you moving this um, in abeyance then? This agenda item. Yes. Okay. If there are no other questions or comments, I'll move to hold resolution number 7161 in abeyance until the special meeting on October 21st. I'll second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Uh, that will now bring us then to our last public comment period. Uh, public comment during this period is also limited to five minutes, but may be on any topic. Uh, Madam City Clerk, I know you said you had uh, ones that have been emailed in. Let's go ahead and begin with those. This one is from Ms. Sadler. I can't indicate whether or not I'm for or against an agenda item because the agenda item was removed from the agenda. And this was regarding an item, um, the item at the last meeting that was removed. I don't, I don't remember what the item was titled either, but the reason I am writing is because we recently moved to Boulder City from Henderson because of the phenomenal growth in Henderson and all of the wonderful things we have heard about Boulder City. We have also come through Boulder City many times and stopped to eat or to attend an event. 
We moved here in August, and so far, even with all of the COVID restrictions, we have no regrets. We have owned homes of all types and sizes for years. When we retired, we moved to Boulder City to live our dream, which included selling our house in Anderson and purchasing a 42-foot fifth-wheel tr travel trailer in Boulder Oaks, which we live in full-time now, and a smaller 22-foot Class C Winnebago, which we will use to travel around this great country, something we have been looking forward to for decades. At Boulder Oaks, we love the fact that we own our lot and have a responsible community association to protect our interests and yet give us enough flexibility to make the lots we live on feel like home. When we first drove around Boulder Oaks, what appealed to us most was the amenities and the friendly people. Unlike snowbirds who come back and forth every year, we, cho we chose to make this site our permanent home. Needless to say, we had to downsize a great deal and had to give up many things that we had grown attached to over the years. But we observed that many, most of the lots at the Boulder Oaks have storage sheds on them so we could hang on to enough items to make life comfortable on this rectangle of cement. We love that we can convert this rectangular space with cute sheds, minor landscaping and pavers into a unique and attractive living space. Now we are hearing that due to a few complaints, our lives as well as the lives of those who live around us and share our community are at risk. We believe this to be an RV resort, something that also comes with pride of ownership. The city council agenda item to address the RV resort's request to change our zoning has been removed and we would like to know why. We are responsible homeowners who have a significant interest in Boulder Oaks, as well as the town of Boulder City. Please let us know when we will be back on the agenda and what we as new homeowners here can do to support the requested change so that we can continue to safely and responsibly modify our living spaces to accommodate full-time living. Thank you very much. Respectfully, Connie Sadler. Next is from Nancy Hoffman, and hers is quite lengthy, so I'm going to start the timer. My comments are regarding the removal of item five from the September 22nd, 2020 meeting agenda, introduction of Bill 1886, an ordinance of the City of Boulder City, Nevada to amend Title 11, Chapter 8 of the City Code, RV Recreational Vehicle Zone, to create two subzones for a new RVE Recreational Vehicle Estate Zone, in addition to an RVP Recreational Vehicle Park Zone. This item was removed with no comment as to why, and I, the applicant, as well as several other property owners in Boulder Oaks Community Association, are very puzzled as to why the City Council chose to ignore the request and disallow the introduction of this bill, especially since a lot of time was spent by highly qualified and experienced City staff in developing the draft language for the rezoning amendment. Furthermore, the Planning Commissioners took a lot of time in the August 19th meeting discussing the bill and then passed it with a few recommendations that were incorporated into the bill before it was sent to the City Council. Unfortunately, the City Council chose to ignore and silence the 277 Clark County taxpaying property owners of Boulder Oaks Community Association without acknowledging and openly discussing their request especially since the bill, if approved by the council, would have paved the way for potentially rezoning our resort to RVE and then hopefully making it possible for residents to upgrade their RV property. This rezoning amendment would have created similar zones as to what currently exists for mobile home communities in Boulder City. Even though Boulder, Ho Boulder Oaks Community Association was placed in the RV recreational vehicle zone when it was created in 1955, or, 1995, it was never developed as a true RV park like our neighbor Canyon Trail. Over the past 15 years, there has been much correspondence between our association attorneys and city attorneys that have highlighted some of the distinct factual and legal differences between the association and Canyon Trail. These include one, Boulder Oaks Community Association consists of 277 individually owned lots, whereas a true RV park is one parcel under a common ownership with all lots available for rental purposes to the general public. 
Our association, too, our association is governed and managed by an HOA. It is a common interest community regulated by Nevada Revised Statutes, Chapter 116. Three, a true RV park such as Canyon Trail is a business operation where the goal is to keep all lots rented for maximum income. Boulder Oaks Community Association is a nonprofit organization. Four, as a business operation, a true RV park is required to obtain a business license and comply with other business regulations for both the state of Nevada and city of Boulder City. The association is required to do annual state filings, but it is not required to have a business license. There is no requirement that a lot owner in our association rent their lot at any time. Although some owners do choose to rent their lot, there is no guarantee that any lots will be available to rent to the general public at a given time. An individual renting their own real estate through a rental agency would not be required to obtain a business license. Six, a true RV park with its single owner, i.e. Canyon Trail, is responsible for all aspects within the park, including individual lot upkeep, overall clean cleanliness of the park, and can be held accountable for all activity within the park. Seven, our association is governed by a board of directors elected by the individual members, lot owners, annually, and can only enforce those provisions contained in the CCNRs and institute compliance action against an individual owner through the Nevada Real Estate Division. Eight, it is a violation of state law, NRS 116.31175, for an association to disclose records of the association relating to the owners. Although the main focus of the proposed rezoning amendment was to allow with restrictions the construction of permanent accessory structures on individual lots, there are additional requirements in the current RV recreational vehicle zone that are unenforceable for community uh, for Boulder Oaks Community Association per NRS 116 because our resort is an HOA. Through the rezoning of Boulder Oaks Community Association to RVE, the proposed amendment would have removed the following non-enforceable sections of Title 11, Chapter 8, and she, she lists a couple. I can submit that for the record. Thank you. And there's, I think there's one more. This is from Marianne Godfrey. We recently retired and moved to Boulder City. This came with some huge and risky decisions, which included selling our house and purchasing a travel trailer in Boulder Oaks, which we live in full time now. At Boulder Oaks, we own our own lot and are proud to be able to make this lot our home because of the flexibility awarded us, including storage sheds, landscaping, and the ability to lay brick and or pavers to make the lot look nice. Everyone who lives here works hard to maintain their space, and we all feel the pride of ownership that comes with owning our living space and being able to customize it to suit our needs and our tastes. We haven't been here long, but we already feel a sense of community here. We are learning now that a few people around us are complaining about our right to have a shed as well as some of the other things we do to make these spaces our homes. We support making Boulder Oaks a resort as opposed to an RV park where the spaces are rented. The city council agenda item to discuss the rezoning has been removed and we need to know why. We are responsible homeowners who have made significant sacrifices to live here as well as in the town of Boulder City. Please let us know when we will be back on the agenda as we have a huge interest in seeing this discussion proceed. Thank you very much, Mary Ann Godfrey. And that's it for the written. Thank you. Uh, if anyone wishes to make public comment via call-in, the line is available. The phone number is 
Again, we are in our final comment period and we have a caller. Hi, uh, this is Nielsen Eichen. Um, while you're looking for city attorney, if Christy Kindle hasn't been made aware, she hasn't contacted you, she's the city attorney for Pahrump, Pahrump, Nevada. She applied when Steve Morris applied, along with two other candidates. Her cover letter came in, but they couldn't find her resume for some odd reason, and nobody bothered to look for it. It was a very odd occurrence. She has criminal experience and civil experience, and she's had many, many years, was very interested, and was very gracious about the way her application was handled. Um, if she hasn't contacted you, she would be a very good person to contact. Um, with respect to Mr. Morris and Mr. Noyola, I would remind them that they're at-will employees. That's what they agreed to. And the city council has made a decision. I don't want to get into now, at this time, the number of breaches in both of their performances over the years, but they're considerable. I respect all of Mr. Morris's supporters and members of people in his, um, the LDS Very Fine Church. I respect all of that. I'm glad that people had a chance to air their views and offer support. It's certainly well-deserved. Um, I'm still stunned by the comments of Peggy Levitt um, earlier, and I asked her if she would like, it's up to her, to play the tape of the meeting when Stephen Morris was hired and get back to me if she finds any dispersions I've made at that meeting or any dispersions I've ever made. I hope that her comments weren't because I caused her to receive an open meeting law violation from the open uh, from the Attorney General regarding the illegal hiring of Stephen Morris when his resume was um, withheld from the public. The Attorney General found that his hiring was illegal under the open meeting law, but it occurred too late to overturn his hiring. If, if she'd like to, that would be very kind and gracious for her to review that and make a public retraction. I wish you all good evening, and I'm, I'm very, very sorry that this has occurred. It isn't fair to you as uh, people serving the community to come under this kind of attack. Thanks very much, and good evening. Thank you. Again, anyone wishing to speak in the final public comment period, the phone number is 702-589-9629. Yes, I have final public comment, please. Go ahead. Yes, good evening again for the record, Council Fred Volz. On display tonight was another example of the former city attorney's feckless leadership regarding city legal issues. The person he substituted for himself on agenda items 15 and 16 has been a Nevada licensed attorney for just one year. The same person graduated from a law school, Arizona Summit in Phoenix, which had its accreditation pulled by the American Bar Association and closed its doors earlier this year. Here's yet another example of the former city attorney failing to find qualified and experienced legal representation for the city among over 6,000 resident Nevada attorneys. If only the city attorney, attorney's intensity for representing himself had been similarly evident in the performance of his city attorney duties, perhaps the city council would not have been compelled to terminate his services tonight. And I would ask that these comments be added to the record verbatim. Thank you. Thank you. The phone line is now available. The number is 702-589-9629.
Yes, I'd like to make public comment. Go ahead. All right. This is Judy DeShane calling. I would, now that the part of this fiasco is over, I'm sure we're going to see a whole lot more from what was said about being sued some more. But I would hope that whoever the council interviews and decides to hire, no matter what, the council will see to it that there is a contract written up for the city that everybody follows whenever we offer employment instead of allowing people we offer employment to to get their own contract. I, this was the first time I have ever, ever heard or seen of anything like that. It's always been the company that's doing the hiring is the one that presents the contract, and they may make some minor modifications for a particular individual, but it's not a whole damn con <laughs> contract. And we need to make sure the city is protected next time from whoever we hire, and yet be fair to that individual. Thank you. Thank you. The phone line is now available if anyone wishes to speak in the final public comment period. Phone number Yes, I have a public comment. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Igor Sushko, and I found the city's attorney, city attorney's attempt to use legal jargon to mislead the public to be quite troubling. He spoke specific, spe, he specifically spoke how the court supported his position by issuing a temporary injunction in his favor. However, once the case was actually heard by the judge with all the facts, which I had the opportunity also to review on video, the judge appeared dumbfounded and dismissed all of the city's attorney's claims outright and denied an actual injunction. The judge found no wrongdoing by the city council whatsoever. This kind of duplicitous behavior has no place in our city government, and I'm quite relieved that we will finally have an opportunity to hire a decent city attorney. Thank you. Thank you. The phone line is available. Uh, anyone wishing to speak? The number is about the appointments of to the people you know, by the city council, but they conveniently forget that there is a you know, number of people that were nominated, and it was, ended up being luck of the draw who was appointed to the seats. Um, you know, one of the other people that did not make it and stuff like that was not nominated by the VCCA, but still was nominated by members of the city council and supported by half of them. And it just went to luck of the draw. Just a reminder of people, it was a luck of the draw and how two of those council seats were filled, and it was done by the book. Thank you. Thank you. 
Again, this is our final public comment period. If you wish to speak, you may call in at this time. The number is 702-589-9629. Anyone wishing to speak in public comment, uh, the number again is 702-589-9629. Anyone wishing to speak in public comment, the phone line is available. The number is 702-589-9629. All right, hearing no others, we will close the final public comment period and move to our last agenda item, the council reports. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Adams. Anything uh, for report? Nothing to report at this time, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bridges? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, report the ongoing opportunity uh, to get uh, rental assistance and utility assistance and food from emergency aid. Uh, apparently, the CDC does give a has given a reprieve in terms of evictions through December. Uh, however, if you are behind on your rent, even up to nine months rent can be covered by emergency aid with sufficient proof that it was affected by COVID-19. Your loss of job, loss of wages, and the uh, food pantry is well stocked. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Hoskins? Uh, yes. Um, I continue to work with Rafi and Workforce Connections on the virtual job fair that's going to be held on November the 5th in conjunction with Boulder City, the City of Henderson, the City of Las Vegas, and the City of North Las Vegas. And it's a big project. And needed at this time. Thank you. Council Member Folda? Mayor, I have nothing to report this time. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of quick items. Uh, 
mail ballots are out. I received mine. Uh, early voting here in Boulder City will be on Saturday and Sunday, uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. right here in council chambers, and also Monday and Tuesday from 7 a.m. until 6 p.m. Uh, you can also drop off your mail ballot here if you would like to do that. Uh, the mail drop box, Madam City Clerk, is that in your office? Okay, so if you prefer to drop it off rather than putting it in the mail, uh, it is an election department box that you can put that into. I just wanted to add that those ballots are picked up daily, taken to the Clark County Election Department, and under lock and key. Okay, so there is security there. It's not going through the U.S. mail. It's actually being taken directly into the Election Department, if you prefer to do it that way. Uh, you know, over the past couple of weeks, the governor has been lifting some of the guidelines on the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. When that happens, we often start to see the number of infections start to increase. And that is what is happening right now. It's not been a, a large increase, but the numbers have ticked up a little bit. Uh, we're also heading into flu season. So, you know, wear the mask out in public, wash your hands, avoid large gatherings, go get your flu shot. Uh, this could be a good situation where we all get through this winter, or it could be a not good situation. You know, we're, we're well over 1,600 Nevadans now who have died from the COVID-19 infection. So it's a serious matter and we need to take it that way. With that, uh, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all.